amid the ruins. Dire way of music. music. What I've talked about in, you know, probably a hundred articles of Jay's analysis is the implementation of the AI smart grid and the giant smart cities, which is what IBM talks about publicly building. And that's where we're going, and that's what I think we have to be really concerned about. So all of these tensions, they are part of a long-term strategy to basically get everybody moved into mega cities. Uh, they'll be forced to, they'll be forced off of land and so forth for environmental reasons, and basically concocted and invented environmental nonsense. Uh, then you'll be stuck in some hellhole mega city in a, you know, basically a carton-sized apartment living over a Target or something, or inside of a Target or a Walmart, as I said <laughs> several years ago. It's actually coming true now. There's actually Target cities. This is all part of the long-term globalist strategy. So, but to get there, you've got to have the constant clash, the constant um, alchemical blending and mixing and smashing together right out of Manichaeanism to produce the convergence, to produce the synthesis. And that's what's crucial in all this and what is absolutely true from an alchemical, esoteric, philosophical, and geopolitical perspective, the fact the ruling elite seek to be post-human. Jaysanalysis.com
seem to think that there's like a political solution to man's problems. And really the, the, the whole of modernity is built on this neo-pagan concept of political salvation. And there is no political salvation for man because man's problems are not essentially political. Uh, they're spiritual. that actually discussed how to invert and subvert that, changing images of man, things like this. So what has to happen is that, that the, the inversion has to be reverted back to the way it needs to be. And that means that first and foremost for man, it is spiritual issues. Those come first. Then we have the things like the philosophy and, and the family and the social issues and things like that. That comes next. And race or ethnicity can be classed as part of that. That is, in other words, you, you caring for your people is just a broader extension of the family, the tribe, the nation. Uh, right? It all depends on what we mean by these words and these terms. Now, America and Americanism is the first attempt at a completely propositional nation. And this is well known. This is not debated in political theory. Uh, I think even Abraham Lincoln referred to it that way. Jay Dyer of Jason Allison. Dyer of Jay's analysis.
Jay Dyer today's analysis. Jay Dyer, Jay's analysis. Jay Dyer today's analysis. In our civilization, man has dignity because he's made in the image of God. In Plato's Athens civilization, man has no dignity. So these two grounding basic principles are fighting against one another, right? In Plato's philosophy, the state is God, it's embodied in the philosopher king. It's basically like Pharaoh type stuff, right? Christianity, Orthodox Christianity is the opposition to that. Now, does that mean that it is egalitarian and wipes everything out? Absolutely not. There ain't a bit of egalitarianism in the last 1,960 years of Christianity. And everybody who knows anything knows that. So be honest with yourselves. Why can't you, especially liberal lying church leaders? You people are disgusting. Thus, my point is that what all this echo chamber alternative media crap is, is a waste of time, it's pointless. I mean, yes, it's good for waking people up, but you don't have models of how to erect civilizations. You have nothing. I'm telling you, we have an existing structure of the Orthodox Church that contains all the truths that we need to erect this great civilization that's already been erected in the past. Now, can we go back in time and redo Byzantium? No but we can build on what is still there, what's left, the ruins, right? Stand, standing on the shoulders of giants, basically, is what I'm trying to say. And when you read these books, and you get an idea of civilizational studies, and you grow out of just a, a very naive, biological, racial determinism, that's not everything, man. There's, there's more to reality, to life, than race. Man has a spirit. Men are all, there's obviously some aspect to which all men share manhood, so does that mean that we go with the universal and we blend everybody into a giant blob of, of no individuals? No. That's the error of collectivism. The one in the many, dialectic. We don't do dialectics. We believe in a balance because in the triad, there's a balance. In the church, there's a balance. In the imperium, there's a balance between the ethnos, right, and the leadership. All of this was laid out for a thousand, a thousand years in the church especially the later church fathers. Look at the double-headed eagle. The Byzantine double-headed eagle tells you everything. There's your symbol. There's your esoteric symbols. Is it Masonic? No, it's not Masonic. <laughs> it's the symbol of the ecumenical councils under the Imperium. It's not Masonic. It's Byzantine. Right? So... Think about the books that I've recommended here. If you want to take what you're yapping and spending, wasting all your time on YouTube crap, turn that off and read some of these books. Listen to my lectures where I go through these books. This is Jay Dyer and Jay's Analysis. I challenge you to read these books and come back to me and you tell me if I'm wrong. You know, one of the ways to show that relativism, which is the dominant philosophy of our day, is incorrect, is to show that it actually is inconsistent on its own ground. So while relativism tries to promote the idea of 
no certainty, no objectivity, it at the same time makes the claim that its own position is universally true. It's a universal statement. So anytime you make a, a universal claim, as we call it in logic or philosophy, this is the idea where you think that the, pr the proposition that you're proposing is absolutely true in all cases, in all worlds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if you argue that there's such a thing as absolute truth, while at the same time your foundational presupposition or, or maxim or proposition is stating the denial of that thing, that it functions as what we call a universal contradiction. And I think that we can show that just simply by looking at its starting point, its beginning uh, position, which claims that there's no objective truth, there are no universals. And so this then applies to epistemic relativism, metaphysical relativism, cultural relativism, and ethical relativism. All of those are kind of a package deal that starts with this position of making a universal claim that relativism itself is true, uh, but then it also denies it in its movement, that is, in its argumentation, and in where it tries to go, it tries to say that there's, a, there's nothing that's absolute or true, and so this actually functions as its strongest self -reflection. All right, welcome. They'd be saying, where are the theological streams? Where are they at? We miss them. Bring them back. Well, they weren't intentionally gone. They were just, uh, well, we just do a lot here. We talk about all kinds of stuff, right? So welcome, everybody. Today, we're going to be doing a pretty uh, in-depth deep dive. At least that's what I hope to do, uh, where we're going to cover... Some aspects of Catholic, Roman Catholic, and Orthodox and Protestant theology that we haven't touched on in the past year. We did a, a critique of Protestantism and Evangelicalism uh, maybe a year and a half, two years ago. And then we did a critique of um, Reformed theology with Kotel uh, some months back. But we haven't really dissected more of the evangelical side of things, the charismatic side of things, getting specific, you know, about the doctrine of justification. So we had a lot of uh, uh, requests for uh, people to dissect, for me to dissect the uh, mistakes of the Protestant doctrines of justification. Yes, there's not one, there's multiple. Um, and we had, uh, of course, the debate between Ibarra and uh, Father Patrick, uh, forget his last name, Father Patrick somebody, <laughs> which I was actually looking for a good debate to critique. I was going to do, because we had some, you know, requests for do a critique of uh, Protestant Catholic debate, and I couldn't find a good one. <laughs> they were all pretty lame, actually. Um, I'm not trying to be mean to uh, Trent Horn or... Dr. Sanjanis or any of those people. I'm just saying that like the Trent Horn debate was James White and Trent Horn debating uh, can I lose my salvation for three hours, which that's not really what I'm interested in. I want to, I want to look at the entire systems. So we're going to do a lot today. We're going to talk about the solas. We're going to talk about the Reformation. We're going to talk about how the Roman Catholic versus Protestant option is a false dialectic and that there are two uh, errors on the uh, flip sides of the same coin. We're going to look at um, not so much classical Protestantism, which we have dissected. We'll get into that some. I've got some stacks of Reformed and Calvinist stuff here that I'd like to look at. And then we're going to talk about, um, did I say dispensationalism? We want to talk about these stupid, goofy dispensationalist charts. And, you know, actually I got my... Uh, old Schofield study Bible out. Literally, I had it out. Where'd it go? Uh, and I opened it up. It was so dusty, right? Little little heretical dust mites were attacking my nose. And uh, I was sneezing like crazy before the stream. So we're not going to open up the uh, heretical Schofield lunatic study Bible. But it was funny because I was looking at my old notes back when I was like 18. I bought that Bible not knowing any better. I just walked into the Christian bookstore and was like, I want a Bible. So I just grabbed one and didn't really know what the Schofield study Bible was. So yes, I my 
earliest Bible is a very beat up and worn out Schofield study Bible. <laughs> so we're going to get into uh, end times nonsense, some uh, critiques of dispensationalism. So many, so many requests. Please critique this dispensational nonsense. Uh, okay, yes, we will do that. Because actually, you know, I forget that I kind of went through those stages. It's, it's so long ago, you know, 20 years ago. <clears throat> remembering what it was like. Um, I even had at one point the John Hagee Prophecy Study Bible. I'm not kidding. Uh, because when I bought the Schofield Bible, I was like, ooh, it's got all these cool end times charts and I'm going to know <laughs> in the world. The book of Revelation is what it's all about, man. I was totally caught up in like the, you know, the goofy evangelical end time stuff. And <clears throat> I even had a rapture t-shirt at one point. Um, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about speaking in tongues, charismatic gifts, so-called. Uh, and really, I should just apologize that I haven't covered this sooner. I mean... You know, I just, I'm in my own world. I forget that there's all these people out there that literally believe that gibberish is an angel language. Uh, I mean, I hate to break it to you, but uh, it's not. And the prophetic word that you hear at your charismatic churches is nothing but delusion, pre lust and emotionalism. So we're going to look at Paul's text on the so, so, so-called, so you know, speaking in angel tongues. <laughs> and we're going to look at St. Gregory Palamas' exegesis of that text. And we're going to see that uh, he reads it in a very different way. He doesn't read that as a um, gibberish. It's the noetic direct perception of God, right? So when Paul talks about not being able to put what he's seen into human language, it's the mystical theology of the Eastern Church, the direct perception of God. So there is a kernel of truth, right? I mean, the charismatics are crazy, and they're, what, what they're after is uh, not what they actually possess, but there is a kernel of truth there against the scholastic versions of protestantism and the scholastic versions of roman catholicism and but i mean we see this even within roman catholicism too right with the histrionic women saints and the carving jesus into their chest or whatever or receiving a circumcision ring or receiving the uh, you know so-called spiritual orgasms i'm not joking by the way um, all of that stuff is really a um, overreaction to the scholasticism that swings the pendulum over into the extremes of emotionalism, pre lust and uh, sensationalism. And so in a way you could say that these, these monastic and uh, so-called women saints are kind of the early charismatics, right? Because, I mean, what they're talking about, the host floating around and telling uh, Faustina Kowalska that Jesus is her... Uh, boyfriend and their their BFF and she's the best non of all time. I'm not joking, by the way. That's what she claims. I mean, that stuff is just like, you know, older stage charismaticism. And that's why now we've seen with brother Roger Schutz, right, back to the so-called trad Pope Benedict blessing the Catholic charismatic movement, which is an ecum ecumenist movement, right? So uh, this is completely nonsense, right? And Father Seraphim Rose has, of course, a great critique of that in Orthodox and the Religion of the Future. Um, but you can see the convergence, right? It makes perfect sense that if I'm a histrionic Roman Catholic, you know, monastic or saint, or I'm trying to do these mental, uh, mental prayer to imagine like the fires of hell, the way that Alphonsus Liguori says, just pages and pages and pages of this like, really sick level stuff of like, you know, just imagine what it would be like to be tormented for aeon upon aeon and imagine the demons dipping your butt in the lava and imagine each uh, poor being filled with the greatest pains of all time and on and on and on. Just this really sick stuff, all right? Almost like getting off on it. I'm not joking. I have the, the I have multiple books of Alfonso Liguori's sermons and this is what he says to do in your mental contemplation prayer, right? 
is to contemplate and imagine, imagine all these things, the use of imagination. And of course, in orthodoxy, we forbid that. We do not say that contemplative prayer, a.k.a. the use of the imagination, is what we're supposed to do. But again, you can see how this jibes perfectly with the Roman Catholic attitude and the charismatic attitude, right? Imaginings, vain imaginings, right? What do the prophets say about vain imaginings, right? They say not to listen to the vain imaginings of your heart. And in fact, Jeremiah talks about where the prophets speak out of their own heart, they do not speak according to the revelation from God. And that's why we see so much weirdness, so much of the bizarreness, so much of the even self-mutilation in the Roman Catholic world is precisely because of this departure. Anyway, um, that was just one element that we're going to look at today. And then we'll get into uh, other issues about the, the imbalance between the individual's relationship to the church and the hierarchy of the church to the individuals. Uh, this actually develops in a period that you may not expect. You might think, oh, this is uh, some post-Trent thing. This is some medieval thing. Actually, it's not. There's an earlier period where in the West, this begins to develop between the mystical body and the juridical body. Uh, this is the early Middle Ages. We already begin to see this divide between uh, different strata within the church. And that will result in um, that will that will be part of what will play into uh, the rise of the papacy. This division between the church juridical and the the church the lay or right, the lower level lay people, the juridical church and the mystical body. Right, these different bizarre strata that that sort of get um, theorized in the late middle. Excuse me, in the early Middle Ages. All right, so. Where to start with this? Well, <clears throat> everybody knows, I think, the story of the fact that the Roman church, the, the Western church, was very corrupt uh, in the 1400s, uh, 1500s. And if you read, uh, you know, Gabriel Bile on, on, uh, and Occam on nominalism, you'll see that there were these new trends in philosophy that were very, very popular. So a lot of these things will play into it. The state as well, right? So one thing that a lot of people don't know is that the um, the state had a big role to play in the Reformation. Right? It wasn't just everybody debating theology all day. There were big geopolitical factors involved, just as there were geopolitical factors going all the way back to the split between the Franks and the Byzantines. And it's no different, of course, as we get into the Reformation period in the West. This is why... For many of the reformers, especially Luther, Luther will uh, rely on aid from the German princes. <laughs> so the, uh, the Reformation is intimately tied to the attitude of certain um, kings, right? uh, the German kings, etc., not being happy with the constant sort of vying with the papacy, this kind of stuff. And you see this if you listen to my lecture on the 600-page uh, Malcolm Lambert book, right? We covered this whole period from uh, early Middle Ages up to Renaissance. Uh, that, that whole book was about the heretical movements in that period and the geopolitical um, issues that resulted from those heretical movements. And so as we get into, if you remember, the book ended with moving up into the period of uh, John Jan Hus, uh, Wycliffe, right? and the early pre-reformer reformers, right? So you get this kind of earlier phase of uh, the, I'm trying to remember all the different guys. Uh, there's the guys who are the Waldensians, right? They're the pre-Baptists, the pre, what would be called radical reformers. Um, there's Jan Hus, which is probably the closest to Orthodox amongst these different bands of people. There's Wycliffe, who's a radical kind of Platonist. He has a, a strict, very strict realist view that allows him to have his um, unique view of the Lord's Supper and his unique view of predestination and election, which is pretty uh, rigid, if I recall. And, uh, you know, there's other sparse movements that will... So, in other words, it's not like it was just Luther, you know, wrote this thing and put it on the put the theses on the door of the church and then boom, the whole reformation happens. There was already 
a lot of um, ideological bubblings and brewings and debates and people that were declared heretics that would lay the foundations for the Reformation. Um, you can also look at uh, Heiko Obermann's book, Gabriel Bile and Late Medieval Nominalism, where he shows, and he, he's a famous Lutheran uh, scholar, he shows the, the influence of nominalism on Luther and other reformers, right? Now, that's not to say that Luther's completely anomalous. It's rather to show that you can obviously see those influences in a lot of his acceptance of what would previously be considered kind of a contradictory theology, right? Um, if you read the Catholic Encyclopedia's, or the classic Catholic Encyclopedia article on Luther and his Christology and his view of the Lord's Supper, uh, there's some good uh, insights in there because they were actually correct in critiquing the way that Luther's Christology and sacramentology uh, doesn't really work, right? It, it, they, it ends up with a monophysite Christology, and Luther had really didn't have much of a problem admitting that at times, right? So he would just say, I don't care because I'm willing to admit that God can simply make it to be so, right? And it does, if it contradicts, then it contradicts because God can contradict because he can, he simply can arbitrarily decree, right? Something to be logical by virtue of nominalism, you see, right? That was the debate with a lot of the medievals was this issue of could God, for example, um, damn the Virgin Mary after she's already in heaven. And the, the nominalists said yes, because there's nothing that binds the will of God, right? God's what's true or what is the case simply is because God wills it to be so, right? And you can see how that would fit into the nominalist scheme, right? Things don't have natures or essences in themselves that are sort of reflective of the, um, of truth or being, they're just, are they arbitrarily what they are, uh, and God can just simply decree them to be otherwise. And that's how Luther can, can get by with his um, omnipresence of Christ in the Lord's Supper, right? His humanity is omnipresent. Uh, and that, of course, is problematic for um, how we would understand the two natures of Christ and the Eucharist, right? So it's, it's a de weird departure, but it makes sense. The, given the type of theology that Luther does. Now, uh, the Lutherans, for example, here, um, they are not very consistent because, of course, they will say, we don't follow Luther, right? Even though their damn church is named after a dude named Luther, who obviously they follow Luther, they pretend, oh, we follow the Bible. Just like the Calvinists, oh, we don't follow Calvin. Even though this entire book is basically modeled on Calvin's theology. Give me a freaking break, Okay. Let's be honest here. <laughs> uh, you are following Luther. You are following. Now, maybe you don't follow everything Luther said because nobody could follow everything. Luther had no problem being pretty radical and pretty uh, you know, sort of inconsistent. Because again, nominalism kind of allows that to be the case. Anyway, so <clears throat> the point here, though, is uh, not to pick a side per se, but to point out that in the Reformation, you've got. Uh, a whole host of movements, a whole host of, of influences, right? The state, a.k.a. the German princes, for example. You've got Luther. You've got other reformers, right? Other movements that spring up. And we can't forget the so-called radical reformation. In fact, we today still interact with and deal with the Radical Reformation all the time, a.k.a. the Baptists. <laughs> now, I'm not trying to be mean to Baptists here, but that's just a fact. Now, today's Baptists are not as radical as a lot of these weirdos at the time of the Reformation. So, for example, if, you've, if you're familiar with your Calvinist theology, you know that Calvin wrote treatises against the Anabaptists and the Libertines, right? Because once the Reformation gets going, you've got all of these different groups and movements. And it just kind of explodes. But again, it's, it's a confluence of interests. It's not all one thing. It's not all Luther. And then it just goes wild, right? And so we're, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, I'm not that interested in the, I mean, 
Anabaptists are worth talking about because we interact with their descendants today, uh, being Baptists and more or less evangelicals. But the 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 old line, old school Anabaptist theology, I mean, is just kind of ridiculous. Nobody really believes that. Although uh, Paul Washer, right, famed evangelical Calvinist uh, preacher who has blown up in the last ten years on. YouTube and online, who once had me thrown out of a church, by the way, for uh, questioning him, which he would do these open air things like come question me and debate me. And then I went and did it and he had me thrown out. So uh, I guess I learned the hard way that he didn't really want to be questioned, even though that's how he built his his talk. Um, you know, Paul Washer, for example, the last time I had an interaction with him, well, this was 10 years ago when he had me thrown out. His whole story was that he was now an Anabaptist. <laughs> so, um, and this was because, uh, I suspect, can't prove this, but I had sent him a lot of books and stuff when I was starting to read the Church Fathers. <clears throat> we used to be on good terms. <clears throat> and I sent him a bunch of books talking about the early church. And he was still at one time, like maybe 10, 12 years ago, interested in kind of that attitude of, um, well, you know, I don't accept everything the church fathers taught, but, uh, we can accept some of it, right? We can accept some of those church fathers as champions of the faith, right? I, I might be a Baptist, but I love Augustine and I love Athanasius, right? This kind of an attitude. Well, it turns out, uh, the more that you read these guys, they have no similarities with anything Baptist or reformed. And so therefore Paul Washer moved into a more consistent mode of saying, uh, actually they're all heretical and the church went into a blackout. That was his phrase. It was a blackout Jay from the death of the apostles until the Anabaptists. It was a blackout. Well, good job Mormon, right? Because, uh, this is what every stupid sect and cult says. So yeah, that's when I started wondering about old, Paul Washer. And then over time, I started realizing that, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't believe that the Holy Spirit, quote unquote, is moving Paul Washer to cry at the same point in every one of his sermons that he gives. And if you've seen him give that same shtick sermon over and over and over for 20 years, yeah, I'm sorry. It's it's his routine. Okay. So, you know, that's what you come to find out is you learn a lot of these people, they're not they don't care about, <laughs> they don't care about, I mean, they've already, he's already invested his whole life into being a Baptist missionary, right? Why would he upend all of that by uh, admitting that his whole system is wrong, you see? Anyway, so the point being is that even though we might think Okay, well, Anabaptists, that's the, you know, who's going to, are there any Mennonite apologists online? <laughs> We're the Amish apologists, right? There's not many, because they don't use the internet, right? right? Internets are like zippers, right? They're, they're from the devil, right? The devil invented the internet and the zipper and the motor car. So no Amish apologists uh, online. Um, although I will say that there was one guy, John, somebody, I forget his name, but like he used to try to debate me all the time. Uh, and just some guy online. Nice guy. I'm not trying to be mean to the guy. Everybody says, I'm so mean. I'm so mean. Oh, <laughs> he's so mean. Uh, but he was, he had decided he believed Mennonite theology. And I was like, dude, this is crazy stuff. Okay. Mennonite stuff is just Gnostic. It's just stupid, dude. And it's, it's this attitude. It's like people go on spiritual journeys, right? And especially when you're young, right? We've all done this. It, it happens. It's part of life, right? Figuring, figuring out stuff. I don't fault people for going on journeys. I've changed my mind many times. But, I mean, dude, Amish, Mennonite, really? <laughs> I mean, there's better stuff than that, I guarantee you. And by the way, do you ever seen Amish women? They all look like damn cows, dude. They're like 600 pounds. So, I mean, unless you got a thing for big bone women, good luck finding a, a hot Amish babe. That ain't going to happen. Maybe he's maybe he was thinking, well, I'm never going to find a woman, so I'll just find me a damn Amish woman out on a prairie, and uh, she'll just churn butter for me all day, and I'll live with it. But prairie living, right? Like, you're not automatically holy because you have a buggy, dude. 
Like God loves those who have buggies, but he hates those with automobiles, right? The Model T Ford is the Tau. <laughs> the T is the Tau symbol. It's the symbol of Antichrist. And uh, I mean, I bet you there's some Amish Mennonite who, I bet they came up with that one time. I bet there is a Mennonite preacher somewhere who decided that the Model T Ford was the Antichrist because the T is the Tau. And that's like the Roman Catholic. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just joking. Anyway. Point being is that although there aren't Mennonite Amish apologists, the actual descendants of the Mennonite and the Amish are the Baptists. And the Baptists, of course, don't believe as much of the just insane, bizarre theology of their predecessors. But they kind of have the roots of that going on. And, and again, I, I guess I have to give Paul Washer credit for being a little more consistent than the rest of, you know, like James White or these people, because James White will say that you teach a false gospel uh, meanwhile, he would he thinks Athanasius and uh, Augustine are saved. I mean, it's just just arbitrary, inconsistent nonsense, right? I mean, these people are just. I don't interact with these people because they're just dishonest. They're liars, uh, and they've been at this game for a long time. Um, so, I'm not just don't waste your time. That's what I'm trying to say. All right, so. Um, let's talk about the five solas now. When the Reformation kicks off, uh, you might be under the impression that they all kind of agreed. All right, well, we might disagree on uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper and the government of the church and the history of the church and the church fathers and the councils and the Bible and the text of the Bible and preachers <laughs> and the Nicene Creed. <laughs> but uh, we're all al aligned on the five solas and we're all aligned on uh, being against the Pope. Okay, um, and by the way, there when you talk to pro classical Protestants, they will act like this is a legit way to have the Protestant Church. Because there is no Protestant Church, first of all, it doesn't exist. There's no ev evangelical church. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of different sects and groups. There is no Protestant Church, right? And so they will play this game where, like, well, there's an invisible church of the true. Protestant believers that exists amongst many different groups and sects, but the visible church is divided and split and thousands of different confessions and groups and heresies and who knows where it is, who knows where. So there's no marks, right? I mean, some of the Protestants will, will say that the visible church, quote unquote, has marks, right? Uh, but it's always boils down to these lowest common denominator generic statements like, preaches the gospel, preaches Jesus, or something like the five solas. So the five solas attempts to be a lowest common denominator way to unify the many different Protestant sects and groups. But of course, as you can imagine, the five solas themselves are not actually that clear. For example, uh, this this is a good point about perspicuity, right? What do we hear the Protestants always say? The perspicuity of Scripture. Right? Scripture is perspicuity. It has its own self-attestation and clarity. So the Bible as a text is somehow more clear than any other text. It has its own attestation and it's just self-evidently clear, right? What's the James White attitude, for example, to understanding the text? Now, this is ironic because James White will do presuppositional apologetics, him and his underling, Jeff Durbin, um, which, if, if you know the basics of presuppositionalism, admits that there are no self-evident, perspicacious texts, right? All texts are understood within an interpretive framework because all texts, all facts are theory-laden. But when it comes to exegesis of scripture, according to someone like James White, oh no, we can set that aside because when you just go read the Greek text and the Greek manuscripts, they're perspicacious. They have perspicuity. They're just clear. What does Romans 3 mean? Just look it up in the Greek. It means what it says it means. But when you go to be an apologist, oh no, no, there are no self-evident facts. Things only mean what they mean in the paradigms, right? So this, that's an immediate inconsistency on the part of James White, who's a Reformed Baptist, by the way, a Reformed Baptist. Nothing more ridiculous than a Reformed Baptist. Nevertheless, I mean, did you know Calvin and Luther 
persecuted the Baptists? Did you know Calvin and Zwingli had Baptists put to death? Oh, but we're Calvinist Baptists. We always set all that aside for now <laughs> because we're all agreed on the five solas. The five solas. Have you ever spent time in the Reformed or Protestant or Evangelical world? If you have, and if you know this landscape and the theology and the theologians, you will know that this is not, in fact, any kind of actual way to be united. Nor are any of these groups actually, in fact, united on what these words mean. I mean, imagine being so naive as to think that, well, we all just agree on these words, right? I mean, this remember Mike from the Urantia cult? Bro, we believe in Jesus too. We believe in a father. We believe God created the world. We believe there's a devil. We believe the same things. <laughs> As if, just because we use the same words, we believe the same things. Dude, every cult in the world will use the same words as we use. And they know this, by the way, which is why, I mean, why do you have to do apologetics, Protestants, Calvinists? Like, why do you even have to do apologetics if the words just mean what they mean? The perspicuity of the, te perspicuity of the text. Well, uh, it's interesting because when I read the Church Fathers, Basil, for example, points out all the time how the heretics commit the word concept fallacy and how they misuse words and they redefine words and they'll change the meaning of the words and they'll change the context of the words over and over all the time, right? This is something that the Church Fathers bitch about all the time. So, yeah, that's, that's not really going to work uh, as some kind of unifying factor. So let's just take uh, uh, these fives, for example, the, the, the five souls, for example, um, and look at, I mean, let's take two famous reformers. Do you think Calvin and Luther had the same ideas as to what sola gratia, sola fide, solus Christus, soli deo gloria, and sola scriptura meant? Well, let's take them one by one. Uh, grace alone. Do they agree? Not exactly. Because in Luther's mind and in the, the, the Lutheran church, as far as I'm aware, if you looked at the, you know, their catechism and their Heidelberg catechism and all that, uh, they believe in uh, baptismal regeneration. So for the Lutheran mind, baptism itself, the rite of baptism, regenerates the infant. Does a Calvinist believe in baptismal regeneration? No, they do not. I mean, maybe there's some Calvinist somewhere who has come to believe this. Maybe the Doug Wilson people have integrated this somehow into their system. I don't know. I don't care. Uh, but no, 99.9% uh, .9 of Calvinists do not believe that baptism is what regenerates a person, that the Holy Spirit is eff efficacious in the action of baptism. So Luther was being more consistent just on that point in following the Augustinian view of baptism, whereas... Calvin is a significant departure in not believing in the efficaciousness of the water, the, the rite of water baptism. In Calvinism, the rite of water baptism just simply signifies that interchange, which may come prior to baptism or may come down the road after baptism, or may never happen, you see. And in fact, most truly reformed, strict Calvinists, they will say that if you believe in baptismal regeneration, you deny the gospel. Because now you include man's synergy and a work in salvation. So now who's the heretic and who really teaches the true Reformation gospel here? Is it Luther or Calvin? And when are they going to be consistent and figure out that they can't both be true and both go to heaven if one of them is a heretic? I mean, when I go read the Westminster Confession, for example, I cannot believe in soul, uh, uh, baptismal re regeneration and believe in sola fide. And by the way, you can extend this to other absurdities like Doug Wilson's group, which allows Reformed Baptists to commune with Calvinists and Anglicans, right? Who, on the one hand, half of the families don't baptize their children. Half the families do. The rest of the families will have their children partake of communion, and half of them won't. This is preposterous. I mean, imagine being a church for 2,000 years, so-called, which they imagine themselves to be connected to the historic church, even though they're not. Um, they're LARPing, 
But imagine that for 2,000 years, we haven't even figured out if babies can have communion or not. And you think that's the true church? You can't even figure that out? Do you, see the, do you begin to see the value of the fact that it's not that the church of the first thousand years was wrong. It's that you guys are wrong. And that's just one example. I can go through countless other examples. All right. So now we've made this point before. And I'm just trying to illustrate the, the, that what we're going to see from this point. I can't. I'm backwards, dude. From this point, you can see the groundwork being laid for how there's going to be just the <laughs> fractal explosion, the big bang of cults and sects from this so-called reformation. Now, if, let's take Sola Fide, the next one. Let's move on down here. Um, between the reformers, do they have the same attitude of justification by faith alone? You might be tempted to think, uh, well, yes, they do. Actually, yes. So this is at least one point where we can all agree as so-called Protestants and Reformed Christians and Lutherans or whatever, Anglicans, blah, blah, blah. We at least agree here that uh, justification is not in any way dependent upon the work of man or individual men. Um, it's solely by faith in the work of Christ, blah, 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 blah. Did you know that after Luther... And after the uh, Genevan reformers, that there were intense debates about the nature of justification by faith alone. Did you know that there's debates that, so when you look to Calvin, Luther, Beza, Zwingli, Melanchthon, and any other host of the later generations of reformers, the debates begin to center on Turretin. Right? We have these debates about what is the nature of justification and what is it that is the thing to be known to be justified. In other words, do I have to believe in justification by faith alone to be justified? Or is it simply to believe in the work of Christ in some generic sense, to believe in the Trinity? Is it to, uh, I don't know, right? I mean, in other words, and by the way, is the, individual's faith even if you think that god does it in a monergistic way where he overrides your will and just sort of like moves you effectually to believe is that still me doing it is is it required that i do that even if you say it's a gift it's still something i have to do right like it's still required of me even if it's god moving me to do it right or he supplants my will in a monergistic way or is in fact that not even required Right? Because, for example, in the predestinarian scheme, well, that was declared from all eternity that God would justify the elect through the death of Christ. And so it just happens that within time and space, the point of time, God, the Holy Spirit comes and sort of effectually moves that person to be regenerated and therefore causes them by an efficacious cause to have faith and to repent and to believe, you see. But you get the point that I'm making here is that Already, we've not we've not seen a clear pattern or point of unity because we can't figure out amongst the scholastic reformers whether justification by faith alone means faith in just a generic idea of Christ, belief in the divinity of Christ. I mean, what if I was an anti-Trinitarian and I believed that justification was by faith alone? <laughs> I mean, you could conceivably have some weird view like that, right? So obviously these propositions have to be fleshed out, right? They're not enough on their own, right? And you say, well, now, uh, how do I know they're not enough? Oh, well, maybe, maybe, just maybe, there have already been centuries and centuries of debates and problems and issues within Reformed theology such that famous Reformed theologians have to write books called Reformed is Not Enough. Oh, maybe the solas are not enough. Oh, maybe the Westminster Confession is not enough. Maybe we got to have more than that. But what does the uh, Peter Lightheart, James Jordan, Doug Wilson uh, LARPing group do? 
well, let's just use the church fathers and orthodox theology as far as we want and pretend we'll wear some fancy collars and uh, pretend that we are orthodox. We'll just use all their theology. We'll use their symbolism and their exegesis of the patristic phrases and terms. We'll use their mystical exegesis of the texts uh, and just still be Protestants and we can do our own thing. Well, yeah, exactly. All right, that's LARPing. So again, uh, does sola fide work here as a common denominator for the Protestants? No, they were not, in fact, and are still not, in fact, unified on the doctrine of sola fide. Now, does that mean within the different group? By the way, it's not even within the different groups, right? So if you've been amongst the truly reformed, there are guys amongst the truly reformed who will condemn you for not saying that justification by faith alone requires faith in justification by faith alone itself. There are truly reformed guys who will damn you to hell if you think baptismal regeneration is true, right? And there's also a spectrum there. And then you go, oh, well, but not everybody in the PCA and the OPC does that. They're, they're a little more open-minded. They're not as puritanical. Yeah, but... Like, that's the point, right? Is that there's not actually five solas. That's the point here. There aren't really five solas of the Reformation. There are slogans that have an appearance of unity. Let's look at Solus Christus, right? Again, we see the same problem with Solus Christus as we saw with Sola Fide. What, what does this mean, Christ alone? I mean, does that mean I can be a oneness Pentecostal? And I believe that uh, Jesus really is the Trinity, right? Uh, the Father is Jesus. This Holy Spirit is Jesus. They're all just masks for Jesus. And you have to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Well, now, you know, no, that's crazy. That's Oh, is it really crazy and ridiculous? I mean, it is crazy and ridiculous. But if we have rejected 1,500 years of Christianity to supposedly arbitrarily pick where we want to go back to, well, let's go back to that first century Christianity. No, 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 let's go back to third century Christianity. No, let's go back to Augustine's Christianity. That was the true Christianity. No, 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 no. You see, we got to go back to, you know, pick your arbitrary starting point and where you think the true church ended or whatever, or needs to be restored to. And you're already in problems because you've missed the boat on the importance of Christology and Trinitarian theology. As I always point out, when it comes to uh, Reformation and Protestant theology, they make a huge mistake in basically starting the whole system. The order of theology begins with justification and soteriology. And then down the road, they say, oh, well, well, we'll, we'll do our Trinitarian theology uh, after we get all that settled, right? But the most important thing is to figure out sola fide, right? And justification by faith alone. You get that right, then, you know, maybe in five years, you can do your systematic Trinitarian theology. Literally, that's how they talk, okay? I've been in this world. I know how it works. That's how they'll say, oh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my soteriology first. Go to Southern Baptist Seminary. Go to a Reformed Seminary. Walk around on campus. I've done this many times. Talk to the guys. Talk to the people getting their MDivs their THDs. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to sit on my, uh, soteriology first and then I'm going to do my Trinitarian theology maybe in about 10 years. I'm not joking. Right. So it's like, you do that down the road when I get, uh, exactly what the precise right, neo-scholastic reformation doctrine of sola fide exactly is. Then I'll know the gospel and then I'll do the Trinity 10 years down the road. And by the way, I did walk around a Southern Baptist seminary campus uh, was it last year? Just for the heck of it, just try to find a debate, trying to find somebody to debate me. Of course, nobody would, but I did find a couple guys who were doing their MDivs, and I debated them. <laughs> they, they, they weren't interested, but it still happened. Uh, and I just asked questions, right? I just said, uh, you know, how do you, how do you think that soteriology comes before Trinity and Christology? And they had never thought of that. They had never been asked that question. And to one guy's credit, he was like, well, you know, I think maybe we should listen to the Cappadocians. He said, maybe, you know, and I forget what's one of the professors. I don't remember who. He said, Professor so-and-so actually does like the Cappadocians. Oh, well, that's neat and all, but uh, 
it's this is not a like you know buffet cafeteria thing. Well, I'll take a little bit of Cappadocians. I'll take a little bit of Aquinas. I'll take a little bit of Charles Spurgeon. I'll take a little bit of John Knox. It doesn't work because these are incompatible systems. Literally, you can't have the Cappadocians and John Knox. You can't have the Cappadocians on Aquinas. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, if you haven't figured that out, I'm sorry. Uh, you, you got you got a ways to go, but you can't. So, Solus Christus um, falls prey to the same ambiguity and elasticity and indefinite nature as, quote, sola fide, as sola gratia. Like, we, what does this mean? Now, the sentiment, by the way, is true, right? I mean, and really... In a way, any of these phrases could be read by anybody's tradition, right? As an Orthodox person, I could say that salvation is by grace alone, right? In a qualified sense, right? Because literally nobody believes that there is no aspect that man plays, okay? Unless maybe you're a hyper-Calvinist primitive Baptist, okay? Maybe if you're John Gill, <laughs> okay? Maybe that, gr that guy thinks that there's no purpose or action on the part of man but pretty much everybody everybody else even if it's a calvinist who thinks that like you know the faith and the repentance is completely a gratuitous gift like they still think that like you have to have the faith right you still have to you still have to act even if it's god literally acting through you like you lose your will or whatever or your will is effectually moved i should say so um Right, so any of these, in a way, could be read in a different sense. And that's why we have to use right precise terminology. We have to use the terminology that the fathers used. Right? You can't depart from Nicaea. Um, good example of this. Uh, let's take Constantinople I. <coughs> can I read <coughs> Constantinople I? In, uh, can I? Because I, let's say I'm a Roman Catholic and I believe in the Filioque, or a Protestant, I believe in the Filioque. I said, well, I, uh, let's say I'm a, I'm a classical Reformation Calvinist. Well, I believe in the Filioque, yeah. But I, I accept Constantinople I and the Niceno Constantinopolitan Creed. Now, when I was a Calvinist, we would read the Creed. All right, so we, we read the Creed uh, before the service. I forget at what point. It's pretty early in the service, right? Um, in, in my Calvin, back when I was a Calvinist. And, you know, you have this, uh, I believe, in one holy Catholic apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism and remission of sins, right? Uh, I believe in the Father, God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, blah, blah. So you've got these phrases that you say that everybody else says. But now, wait a minute. Let's take one holy Catholic apostolic. Do I mean that the same way that the Cappadocians meant it? Of course not. Right? No Calvinist thinks that one holy Catholic apostolic church means what the Cappadocians meant by that phrase. Do I mean the monarchia of the Father by one God, the Father Almighty, as a Calvinist? No, I do not. All right, because Calvinists do not teach the original Nicene doctrine of the eternal generation of the Son. At least Calvin didn't. Right? And there was intense Reformation debates about in what sense right, the Son is and isn't generated. And it falls back, of course, on their incorrect doctrine of absolute divine simplicity that they had adopted from uh, certain Latin theologians prior to them. So in other words, the phrases in the creed are not enough. It's a question of what do the phrases mean? Now, when we read the Cappadocians, we know that they believed in the monarchy of the Father. They believed in the essence center distinction. They believed that the Father was the sole cause in the Godhead, the fount of deity, the fount of divinity, right? The starting point for the Trinity and that is not a doctrine that is typical in Reformation theology. So, right away, we've got a different perspective, a different take on the words in the creed. Now, again, more obvious than that is that the creed doesn't have the filioque. But our Protestant creed has the filioque. Right? So now they, these can't all be right, right? We've got two different creeds completely different meanings to many of the words in the creed. And if I go back and I read the Niceno-Constantinopolitan creed, 
I know that the council says that the creed is to be interpreted according to the theology of the Cappadocians. So the council tells me how I'm supposed to interpret it. And so if you're a Protestant or a Roman Catholic, by the way, or Thomist, and you hear that, and then you're going to say, well, uh, I'm not really interested in that. I'm going to read this according to my late medieval theology. Well, I'm going to read this according to my uh, uh, Protestant Enlightenment era Reformation theology. I don't really care what the Cappadocians meant by the creed or the, what the, the sense of those words was. That, well, that's just dishonest. Right? You didn't compose that creed. Right? Our fathers composed that creed. It's not your creed. And in fact, it's not your creed also by the fact that you have a different creed, right? You have a creed with, and from, the, uh, from the father and the son, All right? So uh, you invent this double hypostatic procession following the West. So in other words, again, don't you see that it doesn't work to boil down who the so-called true Protestant church is to these things? And by the way, as everybody knows, by the time of the 20th century, it's not even this anymore, right? It's fundamentalism versus mainline Protestantism. And what does fundamentalism do? Fundamentalism comes up with their five fundamentals that, that are the lowest common denominator for the true Christians. Do you see this, um, the irony here of, well, we're going to step away from tradition and from creeds. Oh, by the way, we just happen to start having our own. I cannot get this right. Our own creeds. We got our own traditions, our own traditions, our own creeds. Oh, but guess what? <laughs> These traditions and creeds that we've come up with aren't enough. <laughs> right, Doug Wilson? <laughs> Reformed is not enough. Right. Because obviously this whole project, the lowest common denominator, is a scam. It doesn't work. And it's not even a point of unity. They're literally divided on every one of these. But that's why we attempt to be very precise, right? And we, as Mayendorf points out, do not change the meaning or the phronema, the mindset that the fathers laid down, right? We don't believe anything different about, for example, what's in that creed than what the people who composed the creed meant. And they meant baptismal regeneration. So this is one point that we'll have to, we'll have to give Luther a point here on this. Right? I'm not a Lutheran. I'm just saying we'll give Luther one point here because Luther, at least when it comes to sola gratia, realizes that mm, now nah, the church has always taught about general regeneration. And if you're going to deny that, mm, that's that's heretical. Right. Uh, now, the other one's the same. Well, maybe we should spend a little bit of time on Sola Scriptura just because. Now, wait a minute, right? Well, surely, surely everybody in the Protestant world can agree that the Bible alone is the sole rule of faith and practice, right? Surely we agree on that. Really? Whose Bible? Which Bible? Which canon? Uh, I mean, I can go to an Anglican church uh, and they have the Deuterocanon there. Um, I can read what Luther says about the Deuterocanon, he says it's worthless because it teaches works. It teaches prayers for the dead, right? And Maccabees and whatnot. So now who has the right canon of scripture here? By the way, did you know the original Geneva Bible also included the Deuterocanon? <laughs> well, no, wait a minute. Well, why is it in there? Oh, well, it's just in there for uh, historical instructions. It is not to be accounted amongst the word of God. Who says? Says who? Who has the authority here to decide and determine the canon of Scripture? And all of these Protestants, all these evangelicals, like James White, all of them, they're totally dishonest. And they'll just say, ah, the church recognizes it through the power of the Holy Spirit over time. Yeah, but that's begging the question, right? Because the issue is actually whether there is a normative living authority. So here we begin to see that both the Protestants and the Roman Catholics are right and wrong at the time of the Reformation. That poof, mind blown. Like what if both of these groups are right and both of these groups are also wrong? What if this is a false choice, right? Now, a lot of people don't even think about that, right? They think, well, it's either Protestant or Catholic, right? It's either the Pope or it's the preacher, right? It's either the Bible or the Pope. 
Well, what if both of those are wrong? What if those are both extremes? And what if the Reformation is just a manifestation of a problem in the West in terms of theology and presuppositions and assumptions? That's what I would say. Thank you for those super chats. If you would be sure and hit like and share. Um, I wanted to add too, if you haven't seen it, everybody, we got, what's up? 400 nerds in the middle of the day. That's awesome. Uh, don't forget Ubi Petrus's excellent video that he did, uh, putting a lot of time and effort and scholarship into the papal forgeries. Uh, right. So he did a, a mini documentary. Well, it's a full documentary actually, uh, which is a part one and a part two. Um, if you want to see that part two, uh, go ahead and, uh, subscribe to Ubi there. Um, but I also want, I wanted to touch also on the, uh, the solo scripture issue because I mean, you know, we've done many, many talks. I'm not going to rehearse the talk on tradition and the formation of the canon. I've done it many times. You've heard me do it. You can go back and listen to last year's Protestant critique that we did. Um, but even amongst the reformers, they don't agree on the canon, right? That's the curse of that stupid Schofield Bible making me sneeze, dude. It's all dusty and shit. Uh, so the reformers can't agree on the Bible. Then what good is it for us to just simply say, well, but we all believe the Bible's the word of God. Bible's the word of God. What's the Bible? It's whatever I think it is, <laughs> right? Uh, what is Matt Slick's answer on this? Oh, it's whatever the Holy Spirit tells him as an individual, <laughs> right? Again, so no living normative authority, right? Oh, well, then doesn't that mean that we just need the Pope, right? Then we'll have the normative living authority. Yeah, but that doesn't solve the individual's dilemma because now you are stuck deciphering mountains of papal documents. How do you know you're interpreting the papacy right? How do you know you're interpreting Francis's encyclicals right? What about Vatican II? I mean, I've got these giant stacks of Vatican II documents here. I've got my Denzinger here, right? Am I interpreting Denzinger right? What am I supposed to, right? How many times do I have to read through 800 page books to know what the true Catholic faith is? How many oughts do I have to read to know the fundamentals? So, and I'm saying that this is a false dilemma because the office of the papacy and saying that the Pope is just the head of the church and the final word on it doesn't actually solve the issues. Look at the crisis. I'm not talking about the crisis of morals, right? They will never, you notice in the Roman Catholic debates and the issues that we've had with them. And this, this is why we have convinced so many people to leave Rome and to become Orthodox and so many Protestants to become Orthodox, right? And why they won't debate with us. It's not because we're mean. Give me a break. No, it's because they know they will lose the debate because they're not competent to actually debate the epistemological issue, right? None of them have any training. I'm not saying none of the Roman Catholics in the world. I'm saying none of the ones on YouTube that won't uh, do the public debates. They will not answer and deal with the specific points and arguments that we're making, right? And this is why they fall over into, they make it about personal issues. They say, you're mean. It's all about that. No, it's not. It's specific points that we're making about it doesn't work to just say that we have a Pope because it doesn't actually give the individual the knowledge and certitude that it's supposed to do. It moves the problem back a step, right? And then if you know the Roman Catholic world as it is today, it's just as divided as Protestantism, right? And they'll always say, well, you're, you're acting like the Orthodox Church doesn't have problems in it. No, I'm not. We talk about those problems all the time. The issue is not who has problems in their group or church. Everybody does. The issue is which system is fundamentally contradictory. That's the point. Right? Ours is not. That's why ours is correct. The Roman Catholic system is fundamentally contradictory on many levels, and we can demonstrate that. But it doesn't mean that Protestantism is the correct answer either, right? And so what we're saying, the, the revolutionary thesis I'm positing here, which is really no different than right, Father Josiah Trenum's point in Rock and Sand, right? His lectures is that both the Protestants and the Roman Catholics have good points. 
And both of them are wrong. <laughs> because it's they both represent a departure from the first thousand years of Christianity. So again, um, you know, Luther, for example, didn't want, not just that he didn't want the Dero canon. Luther didn't want Hebrews, James, the Catholic epistles and Revelation. Now, ultimately, yes, he put them in his uh, German Bible. But it kind of sets the stage for the, the uh, German scholastic tradition after him which leads to higher criticism. And I don't, every time I talk about this, Lutherans come on here and say that I'm lying when I say that. No, I'm not. I mean, don't you think it's obvious that people like Julius Wellhausen and all these people in these German higher critical schools are just simply following the principle that Luther laid down that now the academics can determine the canon. Prior to this period, right, it's the church, the bishops, the monasteries, right? They're the ones that are going to be the important locus point for knowing and looking to what the church's tradition is and what the canon of scripture is. <laughs> the councils, the synods, monasteries. What's the big change that comes after the Reformation? Academia, the universities, Tübingen, right? The German scholars are going to tell us what the true Bible is. So it's just one or two generations before we get to higher criticism, documentary hypothesis, Julius Bellhausen, right? Well, a couple centuries, I should say. Schleiermacher, right? It's obvious. What do you mean? Lying. I'm not lying. It's obvious that if Luther can doubt the canon, so can any other damn academic because Luther's just a man. Isn't this a Protestant basic? I don't follow. I don't follow Martin Luther. He was just a man. I follow the Bible. Okay. Um, could you research, pray, and study, and be led by the Holy Spirit, and please tell me what the correct canon is? Yes, I will. Right. And I always make this joke, like, um, okay. By the way, guys, I've researched. I've studied. I prayed a lot. In fact, I prayed more than any of you ever will for one year straight uh, on what the canon is and it's just the book of jude <laughs> so i hate to let everybody down but the canon is literally just the book of jude everything else is wrong and but it's okay because i prayed a lot about it trust me now you would say that's absurd is it why is it absurd right because whether it's james white or whether it's luther or whether it's whoever it's just another dude coming along with no normative authority but because he's a scholar, I was a Bible scholar and a Greek scholar. I studied Greek for 20 years. Yeah, do you know how many people I've known that studied Greek for 20 years that end up in ridiculous heresies? <laughs> I mean, obviously it's a great tool, right, to study Greek. But just like any other tool, that doesn't mean that you get it right. <laughs> you can. There's all kinds of heretics that know languages. So what, right? Well, the perspicuity of Scripture. Scripture's clear. Yeah, but Scripture doesn't tell you what Scripture is. Right? There's no list in the Bible as to what the canon of Scripture is. Right? It was a historical determination of the church over many centuries. By the way, if I was a Protestant, why not uh, accept Marcion's canon? Right? Marcion, the early heretic, he's the one that produced the first canon of Scripture. Maybe Marcion's canon was right. right? Maybe... Uh, all these legalistic epistles in the Old Testament are an evil God. <laughs> I mean, he's the early, early, I mean, we're going to follow early dates, right? Marcion was the earliest canon, therefore it must be correct, right? I mean, this is, this is the stupidity of these arguments that you hear from the Protestants and Evangelicals is just totally inco incoherent, totally inconsistent, right? It's all over the place. It's always ad hoc. It's always just, you know. Uh, but the mere fact that the church exists for centuries does not have a codified canon, and yet there's millions of Christians, right? Up until the 600s, if you're Orthodox, if you're in the West, what, four or five hundreds? Before a clear canon of Scripture? So obviously they didn't have Sola Scriptura. 
Well, then they were saved. They were Christians prior to the canon of Scripture. How is that possible if Sola Scriptura is true? How is that possible if the only guide of faith and practice for the church is the Bible when there's not a full canon of Scripture yet? And again, you read any standard Protestant book on the formation of the canon, Lee MacDonald, F.F. Bruce, and they will tell you, they will detail this long history admitting this aspect and principles of tradition. <laughs> and then, of course, the Protestants will say, ah, uh, James White will say, oh, we never deny the role of tradition. We never deny you. This is a strong man. We always, you don't, no, you don't. <laughs> You're just using the words in a different way, right? Because you don't have a liturgy, right? You don't have the traditions that we have. You don't have the traditions of the first seven centuries of the church, which we have. So when you say we follow a tradition, it's James White's tradition. It's the one that he came up with in his own personal private research, which differs from half the other Protestants. I've got all kinds of, I mean, it's just like <laughs> all these funny old Calvinist books I've got laying around, like biblical church government. <laughs> oh, finally, we have the answer, right? Uh, 1900, 000, 2000 years, um, but thanks to Kevin Reed, right? Thanks to Kevin, we finally figured out what the biblical church government is. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate that. Um, family worship. Thank you. Dominier. We now know how to have family worship after 2,000 years of not knowing how to do any of these things. Thank you, Martin, for telling us that man does not have free will. Okay. So all the church fathers, of course, teach that man does possess free will. All the councils, Christology, right? The fifth, six councils predicated on will and God, will and man, especially the sixth council, two wills, two energies. No, man does not have a will. Well, I don't follow Martin Luther. I follow the Bible. Exactly. That's the point here, right? Is that it just doesn't work to do this. Anyway, so we've done this talk many times, but we've got a lot of new listeners since the, you know, back when I did the Protestant Evangelicalism Critique, uh, well, like two years ago, you know, we probably had half the audience we have now. So it's good to, to retread that kind of ground and rehearse some of these points. <laughs> and of course, we should stress too that really the Bible, right, itself uh, does not teach these solas. Because when it comes to sola gratia, right, uh, most Reformation people, unless they're Lutheran or Anglican, high church Anglican, right, they don't think that baptism re regenerates. Yet how many texts are there in the New Testament? Right, John 3. Acts 2, Titus, right? Through the washing of regeneration. Well, that's water baptism, right? Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Don't you think Peter in Acts 2 is talking about actual baptism? Don't you think Jesus saying you have to be born of water and spirit is talking about baptism? Now, when the creed says one Lord, or when we talk about one baptism for the remission of sins, which baptism is that? Now, the, 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 the Calvinists, the Protestants says, it's not water baptism, unless they're like a church of Christ, right? Most Protestants are not, not going to say this, okay? I know that there's some outliers, but, you, you know, all of these classical reformers and Calvinists profess to believe one baptism for the remission of sins, but they don't. The washing of water by which we have obtained the forgiveness of sins. And by the way, if this is if this is correct, which it is, then chapters like Romans 6, right? Baptism into Christ, that's going to be problematic for a Calvinist reading that as the invisible church and the secret work of the Holy Spirit that is not connected to the actual ritual of water baptism you see how this will completely change the exegesis of Romans 6 right so if you're a Calvinist and you read Romans 6 oh this is the 
elect, right? Having the inner work of the Holy Spirit to regenerate them and unite them to Christ. Because the non-elect are, of course, not in any way connected to Christ. Right? And the church is full of non-elect people. Therefore, the church must be the fixed number of the predestined elect. Therefore, it must be invisible. Oh, good job. Now you are a donatist. You believe the donatist heresy. You believe a variation of the donatist heresy. Uh, you are a Nestorian when it comes to ecclesiology because there's not a visible church, right? The church as a body is just as visible as Christ's body. You are the Christ's limbs. You are his hands. You are his body, Paul says. The whole imagery loses its force if it's not talking about the actual physical church at Corinth. Duh. Right? But this allows people to say, oh, it's not actually the rest of that. It's, it's me secretly. Right? It's, it's the text is talking to me because I'm elect. And the rest of this people in this church, no, 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 that's not the real elect. And so, oh, once this church gets corrupt, I'll go start my church, you see, because we're the true form church. Come out from among them, right? my elect. And then when they have a division, oh, uh, then out of that five people, the three truly elect people go start their church. Divide, 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 divide. So, so you see the absurdity of this divorcing from the actual physical, visible historical body. And now, again, they equivocate. They say, well, we don't deny the visible church. The, the visible church is all of these different con, con, uh, confused confessions and groups and sects. No, it's not. Right? The, the visible church is one holy Catholic and apostolic, right? If you're a Calvinist, you confess that in the creed, but you don't actually believe the, the meaning that the people who wrote that gave it, right? Because they meant the actual historical entity, right? The church of the uh, oikumene of the empire that composed those creeds and those under those councils, under the emperors, under those patriarchates. Did you know Nicaea talks about Patriarchates and Eucharist and deacons and bishops. Well, you don't have any of that <laughs> at all. So what are you talking about? Biblical church government. Uh, the Nicene Creed has all that stuff in it. Now, most of the time, people in the Reformation groups and churches or Protestants, they don't know this stuff, right? I didn't know this stuff when I joined the Protestant when I joined the Reformed Church, Presbyterian Church, I didn't know all this about the Church Fathers here until I went and read the Church Fathers. Right? And then I took those questions to my Protestant elders and pastors and blah, blah, blah. They had no idea. They, had, they didn't know what was going on. Right? right? Chris Strevel, my Bonson Seminary professor, he didn't know what century Cyprian was. He thought Cyprian was a 5th century Church Father. Like, What? You don't, you're teaching my class. You don't even know the century that Cyprian's from. Get out of here. You guys are, you guys don't even know what you're talking about. None of them had read city of God. None of them had read Augustine against the Donatists. None of them had read Augustine against the Pelagians. None of them had read on Christian doctrine. None of them had read soliloquies. I read all those from Augustine, right? So I took all these questions to these, uh, we're supposed to uh, like Augustine and they, they would always just, uh, Double down, well, he got some things wrong. Oh, no, wait a minute. If I got those things wrong, you would say I'm a heretic. Yeah, that's right. You don't teach the gospel of grace. Does Luther teach the gospel of grace? Well, I, well, well, he got some things wrong. Oh, okay, so you'll make excuses when it's, you know, a famous reformer that you like. But if I was to say what Luther said, you would say I was a heretic. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> It's just silly. It's childishness, right? And uh, one other point I want to make, too, is that, you know, when we come to the canons of, of the councils, this is a great way to see the, the disconnect between um, the church of the first seven centuries and all of the churches of the second millennium. Right. including the Renaissance, post-Renaissance Tridentine Papacy and the Protestant world. 
Because everybody wants some connection to history, unless you're an Anabaptist and you don't care and you've finally given up on that <laughs> worthless venture to try to claim the church fathers, right? So again, we'll give some props to Paul Washer there for being honest and admitting that he has no connection to the church of history. But when is James White, though, going to be uh, honest here and admit that uh, nobody for 15, 1600 years is a Reformed Baptist, dude? Get out of here. That alone, right? That alone means that you are full of it. Well, let's go to Nicaea. All right. And we're going to look at the attitude of the church at the Council of Nicaea. Now, you've heard us all talk about this many times, but um, today we're going to be looking at these canons, not just against the papacy, but against the reformed as well. Right Now, if you read through the canons, again, of Nicaea, you will find they have bishops. Uh, deacons are mentioned. You'll find uh, patriarchal sees mentioned. Right, You'll find the limitations of jurisdictions mentioned. You will find synodal church government itself there. Right, You will find how bishops are elected. Right, Canon 4, for example, of Nicaea talks about Metropolitans and bishops being elected, right, when three come together to perform the ordination. Most Protestants don't even know what the canons of Nicaea are, right? They, they think the Nicene Creed, uh, oh, that's, I believe that. Oh, I'm talking about the canons, right? The councils produce canons to enforce the decrees, you see, on the model of Dax 15 and the Jerusalem Council. Well, now, so where's your Metropolitan, by the way? which is a bishop of a large city, right? an important city. Well, Canon 6 says, The ancient customs of Egypt, Libya, and Pentapolis shall prevail, according to which the bishop of Alexandria has authority all over all these places, since there is a similar custom that exists for the bishop of Rome. So the patriarch of Rome, in its authority over and, and beyond just that city, Right? This is the patriarchal system. It's based on the custom. No reference to universal jurisdiction of Peter. It's talking about jurisdiction beyond just the sea of Rome, just the city of Rome, because it's likening Alexandria's jurisdiction beyond the city of Alexandria. This refutes Eric Ibarra and all those people who say that this is just talking about his local jurisdiction in the Sea of Rome. No, it's not. It's talking about beyond the city of Rome. And it does not talk about universal jurisdiction, right? So they, they say, the way the Roman Catholics take Canon 6, they say, no, no, see, this is just talking about his local Roman jurisdiction. No, it's not. It's not about his jurisdiction in Rome. It's about his jurisdiction over other cities, just like the customs of Egypt, Libya, and Pentapolis, according to which the Bishop of Alexandria has authority over these places. It's outside of the city. So it's not, so his whole explanation doesn't work. And by the way, not only is it outside the city, there's nothing about universal jurisdiction. There's the comparison of extra city jurisdiction between Rome and Alexandria. That refutes the entire Roman Catholic argument right there, Canon 6 of Nicaea, they do not have the attitude of universal jurisdiction of Rome. And it refutes Eric Ibarra's stupid response that it's talking about only his restricted local jurisdiction. No, it's not. This is where we get the beginning of the pentarchical patriarchal system. Right? Now, again, pentarchy doesn't mean, there's not a pentarchy yet at this point, but it does not mean that there's five popes in the Orthodox Church. Five little popes that run the church. That's not how it works. It's not what it means, right? And again, keep in mind, uh, where in Canon 6 of Nicaea is there any reference to uh, Peter? Is there any reference to divine authority? Nope. So nothing about Peter. Nothing about divine authority. There's a reference to custom. Universal custom? No. Local customs. Let the customs of 
Egypt, Libya, and Pentapolis be maintained, according to which the bishop, the metropolitan of Alexandria, big important city, has authority over all of these. Why? Because a similar custom, custom tradition exists, canonical, synodal tradition, in reference to the Bishop of Rome. Likewise, Antioch and the other provinces of the prerogatives of the churches are to be preserved. So Antioch and Alexandria have their prerogatives and traditions just like Rome. Don't you see that this alone is completely contrary to Vatican I's claim? And every Roman Catholic scrambles to read this in all kind of crazy ways to make it fit Vatican I. But by the way, why are you having to squeeze this into Vatican I if at the same time, Roman Catholics also admit that they didn't believe in Vatican I idea at this time because it's a doctrine that evolved. And you see a borrow do the same thing all the time, right? Now, wait a minute. So, wait, was papal infallibility in the Vatican I since true at this time, or did it evolve? Well, it's like a seed and it grows over time. It's, oh, yeah, so it's both, right? <laughs> which, which is it, right? Either they had the attitude or they didn't. Can't be both. But they will argue like both of them are, the tr are true at the same time. Oh, of course they, Vatican I says, from the earliest days, the church knew that the Bishop of Rome had universal, total authority. Literally, that's what Vatican I says. Then out of, the same, out of their same mouth, they'll turn around and say, no, 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 but they didn't really have this idea of Vatican I. It was a thing that kind of grew and it was accepted over time. The fact that they argue two different things shows that this position is stupid. It's not true. Constantinople, 381, right? The next church uh, council that becomes ecumenical. Bishops are not to go beyond their diocese, right? Let the local customs prevail and let bishops not ever go outside of their restricted jurisdictions. Now, nothing in this says anything about except for Rome. There's no exemptions. If they had the attitude of Vatican I, wouldn't there be the exemption, right? Wouldn't they at least mention Peter in the Petrine office? Suppose No, there was nothing like that. In fact, Canon 3, Constantinople, however, shall have the prerogative of honor after Rome because Constantinople is new Rome. And this is the Canon 3 of this, by the way, which this council was not at the time ecumenical. It was not accepted by Rome. Oh, so wait a minute, <laughs> right? Constantinople 1, right? Not immediately accepted. And Canon 3 is what's cited by Chalcedon. And Canon 28 of Chalcedon is rejected by Rome, right? Because it says that Constantinople has the equal prerogatives of old Rome because it's new Rome. But the point is that Canon 28 of Chalcedon, well, they didn't just make that up out of their own heads. They were appealing to Constantinople 1 and Canon 3. Ergo, this is a problem for the Roman Catholic because it shows that not just at Chalcedon in Canon 28, but from Constantinople 1 up to Chalcedon, they do not have the Vatican I mindset. Right? So you can say, well, Canon 28 of, nice, of Chalcedon... Uh, you know, they, 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 they uh, you know, th there was some people there that had some problems with the idea of, uh, you know, old Rome and new Rome, Constantinople and, and Rome uh, being on equal footing. But, you know, eventually, you know, th th this wasn't really a problem. It was just some some naysayers at Chalcedon. Oh, really? Well, what about all the naysayers who affirmed Canon 3, the same principle at Constantinople 1? You see how this is a big problem. Now, again, wouldn't it have just been much easier, much simpler, if they believed in Vatican I and the Vatican I mindset at this time, if they had the Vatican I mindset at this time, as Vatican I claims that they did, wouldn't they have just known that these canons are impossible? I mean, doesn't Ibarra say that? I mean, remember Ibarra used to say that Leo's tome was ex cathedra. And then he changed his position on that and didn't admit that he changed his position, right? Because he just talks out of both sides of his mouth. 
Canon 6 of Ephesus, likewise, if anyone should attempt to set aside the orders of each one of these synods made by the holy bishops at Ephesus, the holy synod decrees that the bishops or clergymen shall be absolutely forfeited their office, or if they are laymen, they shall be excommunicated. Uh, wait a minute, where's the exception for the Bishop of Rome? Right? No exception, right? You would think if they had the Vatican I mindset, they would say, however, this prerogative is... Uh, this is this does not uh, apply to the Pope of Rome, who is exempt from all judgment, right? But if you watch Ubi's documentary, remember the papal forgeries. Uh oh, guess what? The idea that Rome can be judged by no one. Oh, that's very late, and it's from a forgery, isn't it? Exactly. So they did not have the Vatican One mindset. It's simply not true. The Vatican One attitude and mindset evolved and developed over many, many centuries. And therefore, our attitude to church government, the attitude of the first millennium of the church, is correct. And the Roman Catholic aberration of Vatican I is not correct. All you have to do is look at these canons, and, sh and you can see that they do not have the attitude of Vatican I. And beyond that, Consider the fact that Roman Catholics, again, contradict when they say that Vatican I mindset was always true. Oh, but it also wasn't always true because it was a seed form. It had to develop and they didn't really believe it in the first few centuries. Which is it? Can't both, both of those things cannot be true. So how do we determine, how do we solve this issue? Well, when we look at the canons, we see that there's no evidence for the Vatican I mindset, right? There's not, right? Because again, what does Vatican I claim? Vatican I doesn't claim that there was a seed form of papal indefectibility and infallibility and universality that evolved. No, no, no. Vatican I claims that it was always known universally from the earliest days of the church that the Vatican I attitude and mindset was the case. You see, it's a much stronger claim. And half the, like, I would venture to say 80, 90% of the Roman Catholic so called apologists, they haven't even read all of Vatican I. I mean, it's like 20 pages, right? You could print it out. They don't even know this. Now, some of them do, right? Ones that probably have the PhDs, right? those guys probably do. But Lofton, Ibarra, I don't even think they've read all the Vatican I, right? Because they, they don't act like or evidence that they have actually read it. Maybe they, I haven't followed them in a long time, so I don't, maybe they have in the last few months, I don't know. But um, all I hear Ibarra do is just charging forward the same arguments, even though Ubi has shown countless times over that they appeal to forgeries. They don't care, they just keep appealing. <laughs> like, they don't, they just blow past all the points that are made. And that's why I think that, you know, it really shows uh, a level of dishonesty here, right? Uh, let's see, I lost my note here. All right, so let's get back to the canons here because we, we, we want to work through these canons to show that these are not like sparse, uh, rare examples, right? Like, oh, well, maybe there's a couple canons here that you know, don't really line up with uh, Vatican I, but we, we all know that really overall they did. No. Uh, in fact, the, the there are problem canons and texts for the, quote, Vatican I attitude in every council. That's the problem here. So this then shows that now, wait a minute. If these ecumenical councils are ecumenically confirming canons that in each century represent the mind of the church, and every one of these councils has serious problematic canons for the Vatican I mindset, that's enough to demonstrate, in fact, that they did not have the Vatican I mindset. And if that's the case, then that proves, disproves Vatican I. So I don't need, I don't have to get a PhD in canon law. I don't have to get a PhD in church history and Roman Catholic canon law history. I don't have to, because all I have to know is that they don't have the attitude of Vatican I and Vatican I claims they did. Okay. It's not rocket science. It's not that difficult, right? If you go to our discord, by the way, we have this PDF, shout out to Seraphim, 
one of the greatest apologetic things that I've seen, along with the work of Ubi and, and Lewis and Snack and all those guys, David, Kotel, everybody doing really great work. Father Deacon Ananias, Space Jockey, shout out, right? All we're asking for really is just consistency on the part of the Roman Catholic argument. And they're the ones with the extraordinary claims, right? The extraordinary claim is that Vatican I mindset was always the case. According to Vatican I. That's an extraordinary claim given the fact that nowadays, maybe in the, you know, at the time of Vatican I, it wasn't that easy to go and access <laughs> like all these canons. Well, now we have the internet. We can access these canons, right? Uh, and again, it doesn't take a, a PhD. It's not like, all of this argument hinges on one or two canons. The whole argument is not hinged on Canon 28 of Chalcedon. There are dozens and dozens, you see. And the point, the point that we're doing this is to point out not just against the, the, the papal perspective, but also to point out to the Protestants, uh, you're nowhere here either, bro. <laughs> okay, there's nothing Protestant in any of this, do, do you see? So all I have to do to demonstrate my case is to say eight centuries of nothing Protestant and eight centuries of no indefectible, infallible God Emperor papacy. And your position is false. And by the way, if the papacy and if evangelicalism and Protestantism were false, what would we expect those groups to produce? Well, um, if it's antichrist to call yourself sole universal bishop then perhaps you would expect an antichrist religion and system to develop oh yes that's exactly what we see with the papacy today pachamama on and on and on amazon synod on and on and on even worse and by the way thank you francis like the greatest orthodox apologist of all time like every week it's a new spectacle he's like ups the bar, dude, right? Like every week, Francis, every month especially, just ups the bar to a new level. So I really can't uh, say that I've done too much apologetic work because Francis does so much of it for us. So I think somebody, Seraphim or somebody, maybe it's Greedo, uh, said that uh, perhaps, or maybe it's Snack, said that uh, perhaps Francis will end up in heaven because... Nobody has brought more people to orthodoxy than Francis. So, uh, yeah, exactly. Remember, uh, we want to keep our solas in mind here because we're, we're going to contrast the solas also to the attitude of the councils and canons. Now, a lot of Protestants might not be aware of this, but uh, ecumenical councils, ancient councils and synods of the church, the ones that, for example, determined the Bible, they didn't just produce a creed, okay? There's not just a dogmatic letter or definition from the council. It's not like, oh, they just got together and they wrote a letter. Or they just got together and they put together some kind of creed. No, they put together canons, okay? Not the Bible canon, but canons as in rules and laws for normative church government. Now, because you don't have normative authority, you don't have any idea of what canons are, right? The closest thing would be uh, like this, right? For, so if you're... A Protestant or a Calvinist, you've got your Westminster Confession and all this. So this is like the closest thing, right? Which is like the Confession and then the larger and smaller Catechism, for example. Uh, but that's not what canons are. They're not. They're not catechetical devices. They are church law and church rule. How could you have church law and church rule without an authoritative body? Well, obviously you can't. Therefore, churches that do not have church law do not have authoritative bodies. <laughs> exactly. Therefore, they're not true churches. Uh, and they bear no connection or similarity to the church of the first millennium. So I think that's the key argument that I'm making here, right? If you're getting lost in all this, I'm just making the point that the true church is going to be the one that's in line with the first millennium, right? Because unless you're a weird Protestant or Anabaptist, everybody admits that there is authentic Christianity within this first thousand years of, of the church. Okay. 
to some degree. Maybe you think the cutoff point was the 5th century. Maybe you think the cutoff point was the 8th century. I, I don't know. But everybody agrees, at least, for, that, that there is true Christianity in this first thousand years. And the, the canons of the council, right, which are again confirmed by the universal church meeting in council, show us that the attitude of the church throughout the empire is this, is united on these points. They're agreed upon. They become law. So they are a great window into the mind of the church above any specific church father. That may sound outlandish or strange, but you'll notice the attitude of, for example, Roman Catholics or Protestants is to pick out a church father that they really, really like and say, that guy got it all right. Augustine, we follow that guy. We'll take his stuff, which is inconsistent because neither Protestants nor Roman Catholics actually follow Augustine, right? <laughs> so Roman Catholics are a little more consistent in that regard because they will at least say, well, you know, we follow Augustine, but not in everything, right? Uh, uh, and that's because there's at least some attitude in, his, in the Roman Catholic Church that there, there has to be a universality to the faith in the first millennium, even though they depart from that and become inconsistent and make one bishop the essence of universality which doesn't make any sense it's at least a little more consistent than the protestants in that regard because protestants really you could just pick and choose whatever you want right i mean if you're a protestant oh we want jerome for the canon why oh because he was a, a, a linguistic scholar a textual so <laughs> so why would you pick one guy over the collective church doesn't the mind of the collective church have more weight than one guy? And doesn't every heretic think, I'm just going to follow one dude? Isn't it ironic, right, that you get one guy becoming kind of the spokesman, right? And that's because there is the loss in both of these churches or groups, Rome and Protestantism, of the ecumenical universal mind of the church. So where might we find the universal mind of the church? Well, maybe at ecumenical councils. Exactly. And so in that regard, for us, canons are a lot more important for seeing the mindset of the church in those centuries. And thus it becomes very important for us, for example, to see, well, is the Vatican I attitude present in those councils? Because if it's not then I'm probably not going to be convinced of Roman Catholicism, right? And by the way, it should go without saying, Roman Catholics, that yes, you have to accept Vatican I. But we will get Uniates, by the way. Totally inconsistent. Uniates will come in the Discord and be like, no, I don't really have to accept Vatican I because I'm a Uniate. Uh, yes, you do. <laughs> that's binding upon the whole church. A total nonsense. Total well, no, that's just a Western council. No, it's not. It's binding for the entire church. Uh, in fact... At Vatican I, there are excommunications for the Orthodox, right? They're, the Orthodox are considered schismatic and are going to hell because they do not believe in Vatican I definition of the papacy. So to be a uniate and then to turn around and say that I don't have to accept Vatican I places you under the damn def, damnation definition of Vatican I. This is retarded. Canon 7. When these things are read, the whole, this is Ephesus. Uh, in the Holy Synod, it is decreed that the it is unlawful for any man to bring forward or to compose uh, accusations against clergy or the bishop, uh, and that you cannot right change the creed as was laid down according to the Holy Fathers. Now, this is after right. So this is after Constantinople one. So a lot of times Roman Catholics say, "Oh, well, uh, we can change the creed because." Uh, well, you guys don't accept the original Nicene Creed. Now, this is Ephesus. Okay, Ephesus is saying that the creed as it emerged from Nicene and Constantinople I cannot be changed. So, Canon 7 of Ephesus is still in effect. If you're Orthodox, this is why we would not accept the Filioque. And it's why the papacy at the time of the change, right, Read about Leo the Third and John the Eighth, right? Pope Leo the Third and John the Eighth. 
they did not well that's when the, the, the then you have the the division over whether the creed can be changed right one pope says no and then the next pope says yes we can change the creed <laughs> the pope's reversing the previous the predecessor's decision doesn't that kind of like destroy the point of the papacy if the next pope can reverse right decisions of previous popes uh, and by the way, you can go read uh, the Dionysius Dragas article on the Eighth Ecumenical Council uh, to see that. Uh, and by the way, the uh, I forget which pope it was, but one of them affirmed the Eastern Eighth Council and then reversed that decision to affirm to affirm the Latin Eighth Council. So, uh, moving on, Canon Eight of Ephesus. Uh, this one's pretty long. I'm not going to read it, but it just talks about metropolitans, and it says basically that um, anything contrary to the ecclesiastical constitutions of the canons of the apostles, uh, or, the, or the transgressions of ancient customs, or the canons of the blessed fathers, um, and their ancient customs as subject to censure. No mention here of defiance of the bishop of Rome. Right again, where's the Vatican One mindset? I mean, th just think how different this canon reads from, right, the modern Roman canon law or the, the Code of Canon Law. What is it, the 1913 Code of Canon Law? Would you see anything like that? No, of course not. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've spent, I haven't read the entire Code of Canon Law, but I've spent a good amount of time looking at the modern uh, 1913 and modern, uh, and then the revision was 83 when John Paul II, I think, revised it. There's no canons that read like this because this is post-Tridentine canon law. And it's different because the church is different because it's a different church from this early church, right? Now, somebody would say, well, come on, you're not being fair here, Jay, because everybody will admit that there's like r wiggle room in the history of canons. So you're not being fair to the Roman Catholic because even you guys have wiggle room for the canons. My point is not that. The point is not that canons are set in stone, right? Nobody, nobody says that. That's not the point. The point is using the canons as a window into the mindset of the church at that time. And if your church says that Vatican I was always the mindset of the church, then we should not expect to see these kinds of things. That's my point, right? My point is not, this. Is, and, and every time I make this argument, the Roman Catholics will come and they will say that I'm being dishonest because I'm acting like canon law doesn't change. That's not the argument. Did you hear me make that argument? That I say canon law never changes? Nope. Did I say canons can't be revised? Of course not. For example, the patriarchal system, that arises over time. Patriarchates can move and be removed, right? If they fall into heresy. So obviously, I'm not, I mean, there's ancient canons that nobody keeps. <laughs> so of course, I'm not making the argument that canon law never changes and it's divinely revealed. It's said, I, I never said that. And, and if you're honest, you know that I'm not making that argument. The argument I'm making is, again, very clear, very direct, very precise, very simple, very clear that if Vatican I is true, then we ought to see evidence of it in the mind of the church in each of these centuries. I'm not saying, do you have forgeries <laughs> that prove that no one can judge the first C? I'm not asking, do you have a claim by any Bishop of Rome of universal authority? That's not what I said. For us, what has primacy is the councils because they're the, uh, that they represent and show us the mindset of the whole church of that time. Right? And it's just absurd and unthinkable that the whole church in every one of these councils is putting forth canons that are just in rebellion against Rome. So every every ecumenical council is just throwing out all these canons that represent a deep-seated rebellion against the fact that they all deep down know that Vatican I is true. This is ridiculous, right? This is a stupid conspiracy theory, right? Like, like I mean, is that is that where you want to take this? That, that there's all these canons that don't reflect the Vatican I mindset because they're what? In conspiracy against Rome? They're all jealous of Rome?
Concerning bishops or clergymen who go about from city to city, it is decreed that the canons are enacted by the Holy Fathers that they shall retain their force and for in, uh, basically remaining re retaining the jurisdictional boundaries. Where's the exemption for Rome and her universal jurisdiction? There isn't any. Never. There's no mentions of anything like that, right? And now you begin to see why, and especially if you've if you've seen Ubi's uh, documentary. So by the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth centuries, right? The arguments that you hear me making, these kinds of questions, they're being raised by plenty of people in the East, plenty of bishops, plenty of patriarchs, especially by the Middle Ages, Lyons and Florence period. These questions get raised, and since there were no proofs for this. Now you can see where the forgeries come in, right? Oh, we got to bolster our case from history. And here come the flood of forgeries. And as Ubi points out in the documentary, if you've got the goods, why do you need all these forgeries? <laughs> all right? I mean, it should be clear and obvious in the council as Vatican I says. Right? Everyone knows from the earliest days that the Sea of Rome had full plenary universal jurisdiction, blah, blah, blah. However, it's worded in the Vatican. It's worded something like that. Uh, so let's see. So Canon, we're still, I think, uh, so this is Chalcedon, by the way. Uh, Chalcedon reestates the previous canons, which again, previously limit bishops and jurisdictions. No mentions of universality for Rome. Again, don't you see why they would have the forgeries? Because the canons don't have any of this. There's no, none of this universal jurisdiction and supremacy. Um, anyway, Canon 12, Canon 19, Canon 25, of course, famously Canon 28. Uh, those all, right, do not make sense with the Vatican I mindset of Chalcedon. Okay, so it was, it's not just Canon 28 of Chalcedon. It's the fact that Chalcedon reaffirms the previous canons and has other canons, right? So don't, so he just talked about Canon 28. No, I'm not. I did not hinge the whole argument on Canon 28. But Canon 28 actually is an argument in our favor. Now, next we come to the Trollo canons, which is interesting because Trollo was for a time accepted in the West and then rejected in the West. So again, I mean, with the papacy, anything goes, right? You can have something be true and then you can reject it uh, 20 years later, right? It can be false. Gregory Palamas can be a heretic. Oh, now he's a saint. So anything goes and just keep up with whatever the latest download of the papacy is, right? So... Um, who knows? Can maybe somebody? Here's an interesting question: Could you go from being uh, like Saint Gregory Palamas to being a from being a heretic to being a saint? Could you go back to being a heretic? <laughs> I mean, why not, right? Um, so Trollo is interesting too because Trollo is affirmed uh, at Nicaea too. Okay, so uh, the Trollo Synod is not just some local. Uh, Eastern Council. It had a huge number of bishops. Now, numbers are not the final determiner. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that it does matter and if we're talking about representation. Yes, you can have a council that eventually receives, receives ac acceptance uh, that has not a gigantic number of bishops. Sure. But a gigantic number of bishops also can be evidence of, right, the attitude of the church. It's not the final determiner, but it is important. It can be important. And of course, uh, Trollo is important because it shows the, the fact that uh, married clergy was normative. Having a wife was normative and accepted for priests. Nothing weird about that. Um, and hence, you can see why Rome had to, of course, reverse their decision and re later reject Trollo. But... Uh, this kind of begs the question, though, about the Seventh Ecumenical Council, because if the Seventh Ecumenical Council accepts Trello and Rome accepts the Seventh Ecumenical Council, shouldn't they accept Trello? Well, no, because, of course, the Pope decides what he accepts in the councils. <laughs> so uh, they don't accept this. Um, and in fact, they don't really accept the Seventh Ecumenical Council, because if you know the Seventh Ecumenical Council, it actually lays down principles of iconography that Rome does not keep. Right? Rome does not keep or care about uh, the Synodicon, for example. 
I mean, they have like Chinese Jesus. <laughs> I mean, that's contrary to, you know, how you're supposed to do Jesus. Okay. In iconography, Jesus was not Chinese. So, um, Seventh Ecumenical Council also uh, goes on to lay down canons that talk about limited jurisdictions. Um, canon 3, Canon 10. By the way, uh, Canon 2, the faith is completely and eternally unchangeable. Excuse me, this is Canon 1. Uh, and it also talks about how bishops are elected, right? No mention of the Bishop of Rome electing and choosing all bishops. Oh, but guess what, right? After the first millennium, into the second millennium, in the Roman Catholic tradition, the Bishop of Rome chooses every bishop. He has to sign off on every bishop in the world. Obviously, that's a change. Nobody, I don't know anybody who thinks that that existed in the first millennium. And then if you point that out to Roman Catholics, well, yeah, well, you know, things evolve, it changes. Uh, he needed to do that to ensure the unity of the church. Well, then why didn't the church understand that for the first thousand years for the unity of the church, right? The Bishop of Rome did not confirm all bishops in the world. That alone shows that you have an innovation as to how the church runs, obviously. I mean, can you guys read? <laughs> I mean, don't you see that that's why you had to have all the forgeries to back up your innovations? Because you don't believe this. You reject what the rest of the church did. So you're not actually ecumenical. And then, of course, there's the apostolic canons, which these councils refer to and accept the apostolic canons. And there's all these rules about uh, priests, bishops, deacons, right? Canon 1, canon 5, canon 15, canon 34, canon 33. Canon 39, Canon 45, 64, 74, 81. Oh, and those happen to be contrary to Vatican I, but oh, who cares? Right. None of that matters. Just accept the Pope, dude, and you'll have unity. Really? Really? By the way, uh, has any Roman Catholic addressed the arguments that we make from these canons? No. They will appeal to the forgeries again. They will just say... Uh, Bishop of Rome had the first place in the in, in the ecumenical councils. Yeah, but first place in the councils doesn't translate to Vatican I, dude. That's the point. Notice, none of them ever address these issues in the canons. Why? Because it's a strong argument. And until they address this stuff, right? And they until they tell us whether it's true that the church always had the Vatican I mindset and at the same time did not have the Vatican I mindset and it evolved. Until they figure out which one it is, we're just going to keep converting people. And isn't it obvious too, by the way, that uh, they aren't prepared to deal with this level of apologetic? It's just much easier for Matt Frad or Ibarra or just to say we're mean uh, and they're not going to talk to Ubi, right? I don't care. I don't want to talk to them anyway. <laughs> I think these guys are, are uh, dastardly individuals and they do a lot of dark, uh, shady stuff behind the scenes and I, I don't want anything to do with them. Um, but they won't answer. They won't deal with these issues, right? Because they can't. Because I know what it's like to be a Roman Catholic and to struggle with these issues. Right? I mean, I had all these same problems and issues back when I was a trad Roman Catholic. All right, so let's move on to... Uh, that's enough of that. Like, So you get, you get the point with the, can the canons. And I'm just stressing this because I think this is a really strong argument. I mean, there's plenty of other arguments, right? We can talk about all the, the Bible argument about the papacy, but then we'll just be throwing you know, verses back and forth. Between the Protestant versus the Catholic, throwing the verses back and forth for two hours, trying to prove, uh, you know, weird eisegesis of the Pope in Isaiah, right? The Pope has the keys to death in Hades, right? I mean, come on. It's Jesus, not the Pope that has the keys to death in Hades. That's ridiculous. 
right? Shebna the steward is a type of Christ, right? Not the Pope. Uh, so one way also to demonstrate um, just the kind of absurdity of where we are in the progress of theology in the West uh, is this little document called the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification. Uh, now this is a, uh, as far as I'm aware, papally approved joint declaration. Uh, and of course, trads made a big fuss about this for many, many years, right? So what year was this? I don't know. This was a while back. It was confirmed by John Paul II, right? So we know that this is not, oh, that's Cardinal Casper and Cardinal Cassidy's private opinions. No, no, no. This is confirmed 1999 by John Paul II. And uh, John Paul's representatives were Walter Casper and Cardinal Cassidy. So trads play this game, right? The ones that believe in the papacy. Well, well, you know, uh, John Paul and Benedict, they, they just couldn't, they just couldn't wrangle in the, the, the out of uh, control authority uh, and wildness of Casper and all these guys and, and Hans Kuhn. They, they just couldn't, they, they couldn't re re rein them in and, and they're just, they're just running them up. Really? With one pin stroke, they could excommunicate these people, right? But they didn't. Now, as with most of these joint ecumenical declarations, and I'm bringing this up for, for a reason. It's all a bunch of like generic stuff. And they'll go to, uh, let's talk about Trent, and maybe we can reinterpret Trent to mean this. And let's, you know, today's Lutherans don't have exactly the same. These are the liberal Lutherans, by the way, okay? These are, these are like the worst Lutherans imaginable. Um they don't have that same radical attitude of, you know, Luther himself saying that man has no will. Okay. Uh, man has a you know, no free will at all. They're a little more level headed. And so, you know, we can kind of like talk through some of these um, problems of Trent, which Trent excommunicates the Lutherans. Okay. There are multiple anathemas in Trent. This is so silly. All right. The dogmatic canons and decrees of Trent. Particularly the uh, sections on justification. Okay. So there's multiple sections on justification. Not just the decrees, but there's also the anathemas. Okay. So it's, it's not just a matter of, well, look, we all agree. No, no. You anathematize these groups for their beliefs. And you were very precise, Roman Catholics. Very precise. Do you remember a thing called Exerge Domine? A bull of excommunication of Martin Luther? Are excommunications dogmatic in Roman Catholic theology? Quiz question. Are excommunications dogmatic in Roman Catholic theology? Yes, they are. <clears throat> and it was not just... Well, it's just, that's just for Luther. No, no, no. It's Luther and anybody who believes the condemned propositions. <clears throat> so, just to be clear so that you know, can I reject the, the Pope's condemnations and, and uh, the, the, the condemnations of uh, the apostolic see? No, you may not. Uh, Denzinger... 1698, Denzinger 1683 and 1792 specify very clearly that you may not at all reject the condemnations and excommunications that the Roman see lays down. Now, does anybody doubt <laughs> that Exerge Domine and Trent excommunicate and anathematize Luther and the Lutherans and all the Reformation? No. Duh. I thought the whole point of dogma and the Pope was so that we can know who the heretics are and aren't, right? Now, however, we just have some fancy dialogue and we have some meetings with so-called Lutheran ministers who are the worst Lutherans imaginable, by the way. You know what I mean? And we just say, well, you know, let's just redefine all these words. Right? This is the game of ecumenical dialogue where you just redefine the terms to mean something other than what they meant. And now we all agree now. We all believe the same stuff. Look, we all believe in Jesus, dude. Oh, so do you see what we have here? So we have essentially the, I cannot get this right. 
the Pope, the Pope is now consenting to, right, a version of these. I'm not kidding either, by the way. It's, you, the, the, Luther, the joint declaration with the Lutherans tries to do what we were critiquing in the first hour of finding the lowest common denominator ways to reinterpret these phrases such that, well, I'm a Roman Catholic and I can believe in sola gratia. I'm a Roman Catholic and I can believe that in a sense you're not justified by your works. I'm a Roman Catholic and I can believe that Jesus alone is who saves us. Right? I'm, I can believe that God alone gets the glory for even our good works. Can't really do the sola scriptura thing, but like, so, you know, we can't agree on everything, but we can have a joint declaration where we just redefine all the words to say that we mean the same thing. And today's Lutherans are, they're a lot more ecumenical. They're not as rigid as Luther himself was with his obscene, weird attitude, right? And crazy stuff he said. Well, if that's the case, then do Lutherans now accept Roman Catholic teaching? No, they do not. Do Lutherans teach the real presence? No, they do not. In the Roman Catholic sense. Do Lutherans accept Vatican I? No, they do not. Can a person be Catholic and reject Catholic dogmas? No, you may not. All right. Satis cognitum, mestici corporis. You cannot be Catholic and accept and reject dogmas at will. Can I be a Roman Catholic, for example, and not accept all the things in Denzinger? Is that possible? Now, a lot of Catholics think, yes, I only have to accept, you know, one or two ex-cathedra things. Uh, no, that's not true at all. You have to accept every dogma in the Roman Catholic Church to be a Roman Catholic, period. There's not one dogma that you can reject or decide, ah, I just don't really like that one. I don't really, this Bali assumption thing, I don't really believe that, but uh, I'm still a Roman Catholic. Oh, uh, uh, you know, this Vatican II thing, you know, I just don't, I don't buy that, but I'm still Roman Catholic. Oh, really? Uh, you're going to reject an ecumenical council confirmed by multiple popes for the entire church? Then you're not a Roman Catholic. Therefore, there is no joint declaration on the dogma of justification between a group of totally heterodox, horrible Lutherans and so-called Roman Catholics who anathematize Lutherans at Trent. <laughs> I mean, this is ludicrous. And by the way, did you know that there is a new joint declaration that's about to come out? Right. So there's going to be a part two to this that's going to be even more radical that our good buddy Pope Francis is spearheading. And just wait for that, right? That's coming. Shout out to Snack for telling me about this. Uh, yeah, I've already done multiple talks on set of a contest. We can talk about that in a minute. Um, I'll, you know, I've, I did a three-hour talk on this book. Okay, so you can go listen to the talk that we did on set of a contest. I'm not going to rehearse all that right now. We got to get to the evangelical stuff, right? So we've been talking about Rome and Protestants for a long time. You get the point here, right? I mean. Francis just keeps upping the ante, and I, I feel certain that he's going to up the ante with this joint declaration. But, you know, when I was amongst the trads, we actually appealed to this all the time to show that, like, look, we can't consistently hold Trent and this, okay? Because Trent anathematizes these people. It doesn't just anathematize um, people who followed Luther. It's, it's people who believe the propositions. Don't you understand that Roman Catholicism is so precise and there's so many places in Denzinger that condemn propositions. Why would the papacy condemn propositions? Because it's impossible to condemn every single heretic by name. Obviously. It's not feasible. There's millions of people that believe heretical things. So how do you best, under the, right, let's assume the papacy is true, and we're, we're papists here. How do we best protect the, the flock from being, you know, convinced of something like Protestantism. Well, we can't just list every single Protestant minister. So what we're going to do is list the propositions that are condemned. I mean, there's tons of places in Denzinger where you have the condemned propositions. 
And that was supposed to be for the purpose of the laity so that they know what to avoid, right? I mean, what's the point of condemning the propositions if it's not so that the laity can know what the condemned propositions are? Obviously. Okay, so if that's the case, then we would expect Trent to lay out, and not just Trent, by the way, other papal documents as well, lay out all of these condemned propositions. Well, they do. Yeah. Have you seen this? Okay. I mean, are they dogmatic canons and decrees? It looks like they are from this tan book here. Uh, I mean, pretty sure Trent is an ecumenical council. I'm joking. Obviously it is. Um, and you can't be a Lutheran. I mean, this is a no-brainer. And the Lutherans of today, yeah, they might be more milk toast than Luther, but they're not Roman Catholic. So, do the all I have to ask is this: Do the condemned propositions? And the anathematizations from this still apply to the Lutherans? You tell me, Roman Catholic. You tell me. And and you can say, well, but 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 they've they've kind of like softened up. So what? The criteria for being a Roman Catholic is not softened up. And do you accept fifty percent of the Roman dogmas? It's the whole thing. Read Satis Cognitum. Read Mystici Corporis. It says if you reject any of the dogmas, you are ipso facto excommunicated from the Roman Church. You can't be a 99% Roman Catholic and reject bodily assumption, uh, reject real presence, reject whatever, virgin birth. Right? Any Rejection of any one of those things removes you from the Roman Catholic faith. Canon law says this, okay? So Roman Catholics don't even know that most of the time. They don't even know their faith tells them that. They haven't read Satis Cognitum. They don't know that. But you see, when they do go read it, and when they read Mortalium Animos, they will immediately be presented with a gigantic struggle. Because not only is that the case, right? Mortalium Animos says that participation in the interfaith prayer meetings and gatherings is apostasy. Uh-oh. Now we got a big problem with the Roman bishop himself who has fostered and championed the interfaith prayer meetings and gatherings with other religions, literally with demonic religions. Okay, so uh, like now we're in totally new territory. Okay, and if you can't see that, uh, you know, praying in the mosque toward Mecca and kissing the Quran uh, and participating in the pagan Pachamam. If you can't see that that's a problem, I, I we, we part ways. I don't have anything else I can say to you. And that's why I don't really interact with the Roman Catholics anymore because I feel like um, we're at the point where uh, there's nothing more that could convince them. So, I mean, if, if you can't, see through this problem with Amazon Synod and Pachamama and all that. And I said, well, we admit problems. No, no. If you can't see through the delusion and the spiritual chaos of the papacy after that stuff, I don't have anything else to say. I'm <laughs> like, let's part ways, dude. Good luck. I wish you well. Ibarra, Lofton, Matt Fratt, all you guys. I, I, I don't hate you guys. I will hope that you guys convert. I want what is best for you guys, but... I mean, if you don't see the problem with this system, there's nothing more I can do. So, uh, I, I bid you farewell. <laughs> Good luck. And I, I say that because uh, I genuinely and truly believe that the Roman Catholic system is a uh, religion of dead works. It's a religion of, I'm not saying that everybody in the system is evil. Of course not. Um, I think it is a very powerful delusion, though. That's what I'm trying to say. And I, I feel sorry. I feel bad for the people trapped in the trad world. And uh, I'll give you an example from some of my... Um, I have so I'll take two, two friends from the trad world that were friends for many, many years, maybe 15 years. Um, both of them ended up severe alcoholics. 
Now, I'm not saying that if you're a trad, you'll be an alcoholic. I w- I, what I'm saying is that the world of trad Catholicism produces that because of the despair. I mean, every day you're dealing with just a new scandal of Francis basically pull it, putting his middle finger up to <laughs> everything that you believe in and do. So here, you're, here you are trying your, your whole life being poured into this institution that you think is going to save Western civilization. And the very guy who heads the institution hates you. <laughs> He's your enemy. You think he like he hates trads. Francis is your enemy. He cannot stand you. And here you are spending all of your time and energy defending this guy who hates you. I mean, he literally mocks the people who follow the religion all the time. He did puppet clown masses when he was a, uh, you know, cardinal or whatever in his indigenous region that he's from. You don't do puppet and clown masses unless you think this religion is a puppet clown thing. And by the way, this perennial cope of, well, he's just a bad pope. We got, we've had a lot of bad popes. No, no, no. It doesn't work like that. You don't get to just say, I don't agree with a bad pope. You have to accept his normative dogmatic teaching. Don't you understand that? You have to accept Vatican II. You have to accept Nostra Aetate. And you can play games all day long with trying to reword it in some traditional way. There's nothing traditional about Nostra Aetate at all. And anybody with any common sense can see that Mortalium Animos calls interfaith prayer gatherings apostasy. And the Vatican II popes all do the interfaith prayer meetings. And therefore, they're apostate. It's not rocket science, right? It doesn't, it doesn't require, right, like, like only people with the highest degree PhD and THD canon law can figure this religion out. That's ridiculous. Anyway. So that's enough on the Rome and the Protestant thing. I think we've done... Uh, uh, a good critique of both sides there. And the, the point of that whole two hours or how long we've we been going two hours there was to say, look, there's wrong and right on both sides here. Right. Again, vindicating father Josiah Trump's point. There's wrong. There's wrong and right on both sides. Um, am I interested in trying to find who's more right? Not really. Uh, I mean, again, both of these systems are just nightmares and I, I spent, I grew up Protestant. I spent many years in the Roman Catholic world. So they're both nightmare worlds, right? There's not really a way to say, well, this one's better. Or, no, 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 you need to be, they're both, I'm not going to direct you to either one of them. They're nightmares. Protestantism is the logical outworking of papalism. Because if the papacy, right, can be the sole arbiter of faith, if one guy is the sole arbiter, well, maybe every guy is a sole arbiter. So I would say, in other words, this is the point that uh, St. Justin Popovich made, which is that papism is the original humanism. And this is a great book, full of a lot of essays, multiple chapters, really critiquing and making the points that I'm making right now. So if you want to know, where are you getting all this? I mean, it's really just in this, right? I mean, he was making this this point, this critique long, long ago, and he even pointed out how uh, the apostasy of European man is a direct result of the papacy. And St. Justin Popovich was very anti-ecumenist. Right? Rome nowadays represents the locus point of world ecumenism. It's the, the great champion of the revolution of ecumenism. I mean... Obviously, right? I mean, how could we even, we couldn't have this joint declaration with the worst of the, of the Lutherans if that wasn't the case. Um, he also, by the way, St. Justin also has another little book talking about ecumenism as uh, satanic and evil, by the way. I don't see it over there, but so, um, no, that's not the right book. Uh, 
where do I want to go next here? We still haven't gotten to the evangelical stuff. Uh, thank you for all those super chats. We'll get to those here in a minute, by the way. We had a, a consistent uh, 400 people today. That's pretty good for the middle of the day. If you would, hit like and share. Uh, we'll do some super chats here in a second, but uh, we need to get to the next part here. All right, dispensationalism. Right, let's look at this stupid chart here. Uh, you're going you're gonna to get a kick out of this, all right? So let's remove that. I found this preposterous 1800s chart here. Whoa, dude. Right, look at this nonsense. I can't even see it. It's so... I don't know if you can zoom. We'll start over here on the left side and try to zoom, maybe. I tried to find the highest res one I could, but I don't know. <laughs> right. Right, let Nevada know where to drink. Okay, so. Man, I, I still can't read this thing. Let me zoom in. Can I make this any bigger? Okay, a little bit bigger. So um, let's move on to uh, where, yeah, the evangelical world went, right? It went into this crazy stuff over time. Um, there is a sort of geopolitical element to why dispensationalism became popular, why Christian Zionism became popular. Uh, it does relate to um, sort of the British Empire wanting to promote this in terms of the Balfour Declaration, uh, and the establishment of the State of Israel. All that does play into this in the, in the history of the geopolitical machinations. But mainly we, we, we don't want to focus on all that. Today we're going to be talking about the I just but you should be aware that that does factor into this. Um, but what, what we're going to look at is the this actual goofy system itself. OK, and this stuff is crazy. Okay, I don't, I mean, I feel sorry for the people involved in this kind of stuff because it preys on a lot of people's ignorance uh, and it preys on a lot of ignorant people. And, you know, in America, we have been subject to a lot of social engineering and manipulation, and especially the public education system, right? Like it, it has for many, many years been intentionally dumbed down. So you can't blame everybody in America for, you know, not knowing basic history and this kind of stuff so uh i mean you know the average protestant person just you know we're never taught anything about church history you know we didn't learn this stuff in, in high school and college even college is, is terrible too right so people just don't know anything about church history they don't know anything about how the bible came to be they don't know anything about the formation of the bible canon they don't know anything about the council of the church they don't know anything about theology and most people don't know anything about the bible so you can see why, you know, if you're new to Christianity or if you're looking into this stuff, right, it's easy to get duped, right? I didn't know anything when I was 18, 19. I just went and grabbed a uh, Schofield study Bible. I just bought one. Bibles are Bibles, right? So I'll just buy one and start reading it. And I had no idea what I was getting into. Uh, so the, the basic assumption here, and again, remember that this is a completely made up system by a couple weird dudes. First of most, first, first and foremost is John Nelson Darby, who kind of invented this sliced up weird uh, version of history known as the dispensations. And he came out of a uh, weird group called the Plymouth Brethren, which is kind of a weird offshoot of like different Congregationalist, Puritanical type Protestants. Uh, and after him, there was a guy, C.I. Schofield. So Schofield had the idea, well, let's put together a study Bible for the Protestant evangelical world so that they can learn God's prophetic plan, <laughs> right? Uh, and this was promoted by Oxford. In fact, the uh, Schofield Study Bible is an Oxford print thing. So again, the reason for that is not because Oxford University uh, <laughs> literally believes in dispensationalism. It's because it was part of the geopolitical propaganda of the British Empire. And it was very popular in the U.S. And so this helped to influence Protestants and evangelicals in the West to accept this bizarre doctrine of end time stuff. Right? This is where all the crazy rapture stuff, 
all the millennial kingdom, all that stuff. Now, millennialism is old, right? The premillennial idea goes back many, many, some of the early church fathers did believe apparently in premillennialism. That's true. Um, unless, you know, they meant some of the texts themselves to be interpreted spiritually. There's, there's some debate all right, on whether every one of the church fathers, early, early fathers, not every one of them, but the ones that did make millennial statements, did they even necessarily mean those as literal? It doesn't matter uh, because eventually the mind of the church eventually condemns millennialism in the literal sense. Right? So we don't believe in a thousand year earthly reign of Christ. And we certainly don't believe in a premillennial return of Christ where he sets up a new temple with animal sacrifices. Okay, so this is where this nonsense view gets really crazy. And this is largely why so many people think in America, especially that Christianity is ridiculous. Now, it's not the only reason, but it's one of many reasons, right? And understandably so, right? So if you're, let's say you're in the atheist, I don't know, Joe Rogan crowd, you're a, a, a Rogan bro, and you see this John Hagee, TBN, premillennial nonsense, like this stuff is crazy, dude. This stuff is ridiculous. And again, yeah, it preys on ignorance. Okay, so let's get to this chart. By the way, I think I'm going to have to go whiz. So let's let's just pause for a second here. We've been going for two and a half hours. I'm drinking a lot of coffee. So as we get into this stupid chart here, uh, we're going to dissect the dispensations and get the idea of what they're saying. And then we're going to refute it from scripture. Uh, but I'm going to have to whiz. So give me just one second. I'll be right back. Thank you to whoever made the Dire Wave audio. I like that. It's some sweet stuff. In fact, I may just let that play again while we let some more people roll on in here. Um, so Darby and Schofield, uh, just to make it easy, came up with this idea that we could divide history into these sort of arbitrary sections based on a model of the, I mean, ironically, it's kind of like a reverse covenant theology, right? So if you know about biblical theology, you have the successive covenants, right? Um, Adam. Uh, Noah, uh, uh, Abraham, Moses, etc. 
David and then up to Jesus. Um, rather than, this is sort of like the opposite of covenant theology, if you want to understand it in an um, inverse type of way. So the, the opposite of covenant theology would be one where there's not a unity of God's plan from the time of Adam up through the Old Testament to Christ. Rather, there's these kind of like disparate, disconnected chunks and sections of history. So uh, early on, let's see, I got to... And I would imagine that I'm not a dispensationalist historian. I do have right next to me, by the way, the uh, premillennial uh, dictionary, uh, the dictionary of premillennial theology. Um, I have I have quite a few evangelical premillennial works, so I'm not making this up. I'm not being unfair to anyone. Um, I'm going to attempt to accurately present people's positions, but we're not going to go through every stupid heretic's position. So we're going to have to kind of sum up and like. Um, you know, kind of put these in an overview. So not everybody believed in this like Adamite or pre-Adamite um, theory that, oh, there was a, an original earth uh, in Genesis 1-1 and then there was all these pre-Adamites and then there was a chaotic earth in Genesis 1-2 and then God created the world. I mean, this is a bizarre theory that I don't remember who came up with the pre-Adamite theory, but it's just it's just a weird Protestant thing. Um, and it usually ties into this goofy premillennial stuff. Uh, but regardless, so they'll say, all right, you've got this uh, kind of early section here where there was this testing with Adam. And then uh, there was a fall, obviously, with, with Satan and Satan-tempted uh, man. But that was actually going on in this early pre-Adamite earth, <laughs> the world that then was, uh, before God created in the sense of the creation week. So um, we're going to call this, he says, the Edenic dispensation. So this is prior to the, the flood, and it's, it's this plan that God has during this early period for uh, man to either choose to come back to God or choose to go in a different direction. So the, the dispensations relate to the attitude that God has. It's God's dispensation towards man, depending upon what he man chooses in these different periods. Now, how and where he came up with these divisions, uh, you, I have no idea. <laughs> but again, it's kind of just a um, reverse covenant theology, basically. <clears throat> Rather than God having one unified plan, God keeps kind of modifying the plan. Oh, that's, well, plan A messed up. I'm going to try plan B now, right? So plan B is the antediluvian age after the flood. Well, I messed up. I got to flood the world, start over. And we're going to give man another testing here. So the first stage, they called it the Edenic dispensation, and it was the uh, age of innocence, right? Man is judged on the basis of conscience and innocence, <clears throat> Or excuse me, on the basis of uh, the garden, and this is prior to, quote, conscience. Now, this is stupid because, I mean, didn't Adam and Eve have conscience? I mean, this is weird. But then it's, well, no, now that we're going to uh, judge man on the basis of conscience, can he keep the law? Uh, he failed in the garden. So dispensation two will be the post-Diluvian, um, excuse me, the anti-Diluvian, uh, dispensation after the flood of conscience. Man will be judged on the basis of conscience, and it looks like uh, he's not going to fulfill it, right? So we're going to have to send the flood. So the flood comes, and then the next dispensation after the, the flood, he calls it the human government dispensation number three. Again, totally arbitrary, right? I mean, as if there wasn't human government prior to, I mean, it's just stupid, okay? Uh, that lasts for 427 years. <laughs> Uh, then we're going to have the family dispensation. Human government didn't work. We got the Tower of Babel. Got to go destroy that. Plan, what are we on? A, B, C, D. Plan D is the pa patriarchal dispensation. Uh, let me just make sure you guys can see these ridiculous divisions here. <clears throat> now, the patriarchal dispensation... Uh, 
you could, as you can imagine, that is Abraham, right? Uh, we'll judge uh, man on the basis of God saying, I will judge man on the basis of how he relates now in family government. Because human government didn't work. It led to Babel. Uh, family government, patriarchal dispensation. Oh, it fails. Uh-oh. Plan A, B, C, D, E, right? Plan E, the legal dispensation. This is law, right? And so here we got uh, Israel, Moses, right? All the way up to uh, the time of Christ. And uh, if we go down here to... <laughs> the charts of the grave and death. He's got the fallen angels. And basically this entire period after the fall is the, the age of death and the grave. Uh, and the, the quote present age is one of degeneration. You'll notice. So notice the sort of um, implicit. What's the word I'm looking for? pessimism basically right of uh everything is destined to just get worse and worse and worse um and notice there under the giving of the law and the moses to christ period you'll notice the 69 weeks now this is where you get a really ridiculous utterly preposterous idea that the 69 weeks of daniel 9 24 to 27 occur and then are postponed for this plan E, which is the dispensation of grace, the times of the Gentiles. So God pauses the 69th week of Daniel, brings in the time of the Gentiles to bring the church in under the, the church, the dispensation of the church, phase six here, plan E or F or whatever. And then at the end of this age, which by the way, wouldn't you know, of course we live in the end times in this scheme. The second advent will occur, which will inaugurate the last week of Daniel because there was a pause. God hit the pause button on the last week of Daniel. This is so dumb. As if the last week of Daniel isn't obviously talking about the first advent of Christ. The prince, the Messiah who comes, puts an end to sacrifice and brings in everlasting righteousness. He brought that at the first advent, goofballs. Not It's not paused for 2,000 years of the church to then be hit, hit play on the, <laughs> the play button again. Right, but so you, you get the idea here. You're, you're starting to, I guess, see the point of the system, right? It's what it, what it now vindicates. So it allows for the... Uh, nation state of Israel as an eschatological reality to come into play so that the messianic dispensation of the millennium phase seven right right plan a didn't work all the plans up to plan e f I guess we're at now g <laughs> uh the millennial the messi <clears throat> messianic millennial age when Jesus comes back to judge the nations and set up the thousand-year millennial kingdom on earth. They're, they think Isaiah 35, 1 to 2, and Deuteronomy 28, 13 will fulfill the failed predictions. Well, they're not failed, but in the sense that they they weren't fulfilled by the church. They're fulfilled at the second advent when Jesus sets up a millennial kingdom. And I'm not kidding, will reinstitute the temple. Because, well, don't all those Old Testament verses say that the Messiah will reign from Jerusalem, from the temple? Yeah, because they don't understand it's talking about the church, right? They think that the Gentile church is this sort of sidestep until the millennial kingdom in the nation of Israel. So then, uh, after this thousand-year kingdom of the millennial, literal millennial age, where Apparently, Jesus has reinstituted animal sacrifices at the temple, which right Hebrews says we don't need anymore, but no, we do. Uh, then there will be the renovation of earth by fire, and then there will be the new heavens and the new earth. Okay, so don't forget the rapture, by the way. Now, some of these people, uh, 
do not all agree on the pre-tribulation rapture. Some of them believe in a mid-tribulation rapture, and some of them believe in a post-tribulation rapture. Now, the tribulation, meaning the 70th week of Daniel, that last week of Daniel's 70 weeks, which was put on pause until the judgment period, right? The week being seven years here, right? We, we don't mean weeks in the sense of literal weeks. The 70 weeks are 70 weeks of seven years. So the seven-year tribulation in this view is what's inaugurated, right, when, you know, Antichrist comes or whatever. It's not, by most of them, by the rapture, right? So when the rapture happens, this kicks off the uh, seal bowl judgments of Revelation, right? And most of them say, well, when John says I was caught up into heaven <laughs> in Revelation 4, that that's the proof of a rapture before the before the tribulation. Because John John's caught up into heaven, that's the rapture. And then he sees the judgments uh, that are poured out on the nations. Literally, that's what they think is the proof. I'm not joking. It's it's that dumb. Okay. Nothing that John doesn't say anything about right, the church being taken out of tribulation. And by the way, John is writing about the tribulation that happened in 70 AD. Duh. So you'll notice this whole system, this whole ridiculous system is built on misinterpreting the unity of God's covenant which we've shown in countless talks, right? And dividing it up into all these ridiculous plan A, plan B, plan C models and this stupid pause of Daniel 9 to the end of the world when Daniel 9 has nothing to do, it doesn't say anything about a pause, right? The, set, the, the week that the Messiah comes is what Jesus did in his first advent. This whole system is built on Foolishly misunderstanding what Jesus fulfills at his first advent, the reign, or the reign of Christ in the church. How do I prove that? Every New Testament text about the ascension of Christ speaks of it as a present reality. When Jesus Christ ascended, he sat at the right hand of the Father, awaiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. The reign began when he ascended. In every New Testament text, Quoting Psalm 110 says that there's no pause button. <laughs> this is ridiculous. So there you go. There's the whole. And by the way, the text in Thessalonians about being caught up into the cloud. Yes, they do try to use that text. That's just talking about the last day. Okay. doesn't say anything about before the end times, you will be caught up into the clouds and I will keep you from the end times. Right. It's, it's all just nonsense. And you can go to all the Isaiah talks that we've done. You can go to the texts that I've covered many, many times. I'm going to list them here in a minute for you once again. That will demonstrate for you that the Gentile church is not a contrast or a postponement of the prophecies of Israel in terms of the kingdom. The Gentile church is the fulfillment of the prophetic texts in the prophets about Israel the kingdom, because the kingdom is the church. You see, these people don't believe that the kingdom is the church. They think the kingdom is some other thing to come when Jesus literally comes back and reinstitutes animal sacrifices, which Hebrews and Galatians say is ridiculous. You have two entire letters written about the end of animal sacrifices. And these people ludicrously believe that Jesus will undo the work that he did to reinstitute animal sacrifices. There's nothing more absurd than that. I'm not joking, by the way. Now, how do we uh, quickly and easily disprove this nonsense? Well, I'll do it for you right here. How do we show that the Gentile church is the kingdom. Now, when I say the Gentile church, I don't mean just Gentiles. Obviously, all of the ethnicities are, are brought into the church. I'm just speaking of when it talks about the times of the Gentiles, it's talking about the church period. Yes, that's true. The period of the church when the Gentiles are being brought into the covenant. That's correct. That is true. But that is not something different from the kingdom of God. In fact, the parables that Jesus gives in Matthew 22, right? The vineyard, vine owner, uh, the vine dresser, all of those parables. 
Luke 21 makes it all very clear that the Gentile nations coming into the church fulfills the promises, right? That you had in dozens of places in the Old Testament. And in fact, Romans 15 and 16, Paul cites those texts in the Old Testament about the Gentiles coming into the church to be the fulfillment in his day. It's not the end of the world. So here you go. Are you ready? I can't even remember. Jeremiah 3, 14 to 18 and 19. Hosea 1, 10 and 11. Malachi 1, 11 and 12. Habakkuk 2, 14 and 15. Ezekiel 47, 42 and 23. Isaiah 9, 1 and 2. Isaiah, ready? Here's a whole bunch in Isaiah. 11, 1 through 10. 19, 18 through 25. 25, 5 through 10. 41, 1 through 5. 42, 1 through, t- 1 through 12. Jeremiah 25, 18. 16, 19 through 21. 38, 31 to 34. Micah 4, 1 through 4. Zechariah 2, 15. Zechariah 8, 21 to 23. Tobit 13, 13. Tobit 14, 5 through 7. Luke 2, 32 in relation to those texts. Matthew 8, 11 to 13 in relation to those texts. Isaiah 43, 5 through 7. Psalm 17. Psalm 44, 50. Psalm 22, 28 to 29. Psalm 56, 9 and 10. Psalm 59, 9 through 10. Psalm 65, 8. All of Psalm 66 and 67. Psalm 71. 8 through 11 and 17 to 18. Psalm 81, 8. Psalm 85, 8. These are all, and there's many, many more. These are all texts that predict that the Messianic age will be seen when the Gentile nations worship the God of Israel. When there are Gentile priests, Isaiah was it 65 the end of Isaiah who stand over the flocks of Israel how could there be a Gentile priest well the church is the Gentile priest you see now those are all prophetic texts that if you look at the way for example in Romans 15 right when Paul is talking about who the church is Paul says you guys in Rome are the fulfillment of of those prophetic texts, right? Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. Praise the Lord, you Gentiles. Laud him. For this reason, I will sing to you amongst the Gentiles. All right, this is Romans 15, uh, 9, 10, 11, 12. Paul is not saying that the kingdom and those, those prophetic texts are at the end of the world, right? The dispensational premillennials has to say that those texts that Paul cites are only fulfilled at the end of the world. No, Paul says now, now, now. Now let's cut really quick to the chase and show all of this in one fell swoop to be easily decimated and destroyed. What's one favorite text of these crazed dispensational premillennialists that I could use to show that their whole system is ridiculous. Is there one text? Yes. Now there's many, right? I'm not, I'm not hinging my entire argument just on this, but I'm, I'm just making the point that, guess what? Uh, I can easily show this to be totally silly. Let's take the prophecy of Joel, right? Uh, If you don't know, Joel is, of course, one of the minor prophets. And Joel had this uh, very important prophecy, right, where he says that one day it's not just Israelites and the nation of Israel that will be God's prophets, but in fact that all of the nations will have the Spirit of God poured out on them and they will all see visions, they will speak 
and prophesy according to the Spirit. They will see blood, fire, vapor, smoke, sun turned to darkness, the moon turned to blood. Famously, of course, this is Joel 2. Right. Now, almost every goofball Protestant evangelical that I've ever encountered or ever read, premillennial, they think that's talking about the end of the world. Right? That That's going to be a sign to the, to the nation of Israel that when they see the the Spirit of God poured on all nations. They'll see these end times visions. And all. What does Peter say is the fulfillment of Joel 2? Does Peter say that Joel 2 is something that we're waiting for at the end of the world? No. Peter is very clear in Acts 2. Acts 2 is a famous event called Pentecost. Have you ever heard of this? Dispensationalists, do you know about Pentecost? Right. Did you know there's a bunch of texts in the Old Testament that say that the pouring out of the Holy Spirit will be the arrival of the kingdom? Acts 2, Peter gives a sermon where he says that the last days are fulfilled at Acts 2, Pentecost. Pentecost in Acts 2 is the fulfillment of Joel 2. That alone destroys the entire paradigm of all of this dispensational gobbledygook. Because they automatically just assume when it says last days, it's talking about the end of the world. No. The last days were inaugurated at the first advent of the Messiah. Peter standing up with the 11, verse 14, raised his voice and said, this is when Pentecost happens. Do you know what Pentecost is? The Holy Spirit coming on the disciples. Peter says, men of Judea, all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. Heed my words. For the men are not drunk, as you suppose, but are in fact uh, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. This event here, Pentecost. I will pour out my spirit in the last days on all flesh, not just Jews, but on all. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will, see, will dream dreams. And on my men servants and maid servants, I will pour my spirit in those days. They will prophesy and they will show wonders in heaven above and signs on earth below. Blood and fire, vapor and smoke. This is what happened in the first century. Have you read the book of Acts? Have you read Josephus? Did you know that this happened at the destruction of the temple? The moon will be turned to blood. This is before the coming great and awesome day of the Lord. It will come to pass. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Yes, I'm saying that this is referring to the first century, to Pentecost. And not just Pentecost, but this period, right, of the arrival of the kingdom. Pentecost is key in redemptive history for that. And the arrival of the New Testament doesn't just... It's not just when Jesus has ascended. Have you read Hebrews? Right? Hebrews says that the old administration has to be rolled up like a garment and tossed away. When was the old administration, a.k.a. the temple and its sacrifices, rolled up and done away? At 70 AD, when Titus and the Roman centurion, or the, the Roman legions, came and destroyed the temple. Fulfilling what Luke 21 says, that this temple will be raised. Jesus predicts what happened in 70 AD. It's abundantly clear that Luke 21 is talking about 70 AD. And you will notice the pattern here that just like with Luke 21, Peter does not postpone Joel's prophecy to the end of the world. He applies it to his day. This is not just one example. This is an example of the hermeneutical paradigm of the fulfillment of these events at the first advent, you see. So guess what? These other prophetic texts, they're also talking about the first advent. Now, I'm not saying full preterism is true. We have a whole other talk where I go into uh, the partial fulfillment of prophecies. I'm not saying that there's not a return of Christ. Of course we believe in the return of Christ. 
All right, that's part of the creed. But but Joel is not talking about premillennial dispensationalism. And I just showed you that it's not from Peter's own words. In fact, he goes on to say that the fallen tabernacle of David that's prophesied in the prophets to be resurrected and restored is the church. The tabernacle of David, according to premillennial dispensationalists, means that Jesus is going to set up another temple and reinstitute animal sacrifices. No, Peter says, the book of Acts says that the fallen tabernacle of David being restored is the church, which is the kingdom. Does Jesus call the church the kingdom? I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this stone I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church is the kingdom. The kingdom of God does not come with signs to be seen. They will say, look here, look there. The kingdom of God is within you, Jesus says in Luke, because it's the presence of the Holy Spirit. What does Jesus say to the woman at the well, John 4? Right? Exactly that point. The Holy Spirit in you is the kingdom. I am the Messiah. I am here. The kingdom is in your midst. <laughs> so the whole message right, of the unity of the Bible and the fulfillment and the powerful prophetic proof, right? Do you understand how stupid it is to undercut Christianity? And one of the most powerful proofs for Christianity, a.k.a. all of these predictions being fulfilled at the first advent by dispensational idiocy, you destroy your own religion, which is so powerfully proven by the dozens of verses I gave you about the Gentile church being the kingdom. Now, a lot more could be said. You could go into uh, uh, many, many, many more, more texts that will disprove right but i don't all i have to do is to tell you this principle if you want to disprove dispensationalism all you have to do is look at the way the new testament writers cite and use the psalms and the prophets to show that the fulfillment is occurring in their day over and over and over now again i'm not saying that there's no future fulfillment or there's no end times i'm not saying that there is but I'm saying that most of the time, the attitude and the hermeneutic, the exegesis of the Old Testament by the apostles and in Paul's letters and epistles is of a present day fulfillment and that the reality of the kingdom exists in the church. Where is the kingdom? It's where the Holy Spirit is. Where is that? In the church. Peace be upon you the Israel of God. I mean, have you read Galatians? <laughs> what does Galatians say? Galatians says that the church is the kingdom. I mean, imagine not knowing this. Imagine reading Hebrews and thinking that a temple and animal sacrifices will be built again. It's just ludicrous. Just ignorance. Extreme ignorance. Foolishness. Uh, if you do want more on that topic, I already did like a three hour talk on that. So I'm going to have to go be on somebody's podcast here in a minute. So I, I kept to go. But um, when we did a whole talk on uh, the biblical presentation of what the beast system actually is, and we get into Nero and all that, you can go watch that talk, uh, which I did, uh, I don't know, eight months ago, somewhere in there, a year ago. Yes, exactly. I mean, there's so many texts in the New Testament that apply, right? The statements to Israel, to the church. So anyway, um, that I think is a good just sort of outline of, again, I don't have to, I shouldn't have to take you through every text because all you have to do is look at the way the New Testament consistently exegetes and cites the Old Testament. And it's almost always, right, about a fulfillment that, ex that exists in the days of the apostles themselves. Right? 
and, and to, again, the entire book of Hebrews is written to show that there's no going back. You can't go back to the temple system. It's just ludicrous. Um, all right. Now, on the uh, charismatic gifts, one thing I'll say is that there's many texts in the Old Testament that actually prophesy that the events of Pentecost would be a sign to Israel. So let's understand the redemptive historical purpose and meaning of Pentecost first, okay? Which, again, in the context of these many, many passages talking about the Gentile church and how that would be a sign to Israel, one of the signs to Israel would be that... The Canaanite, the Egyptian, would speak the language of the God of Israel, would speak in some miraculous way that would kind of blow the minds right, of Jews. And so that would be a miraculous sign to Jews. that the, mess the messianic age had come <clears throat> so let's look at so if you look back to acts 2 i've got so many notes in this old bible it's hard to, to see i believe it's isaiah 24 it's either 24 or 28. Now, when I did the Isaiah talk, I covered this, by the way. But Okay, yeah, so it's, it's Isaiah 28, excuse me, not 24. So 28. Yeah, here we go. So there's a prediction in Isaiah 28, um, where, which reads, Expectation of affliction upon these people, great delusion. Right, He's, he was talking about earlier. By reason of the contempt of lips and of another tongue, they will speak to this people, saying to them, This is rest for the hungry, so that they may... Um, paraphrasing, go backwards and fall down and they will be in danger of being crushed. Um, we have made a covenant with Hades and our agreement with death. So Isaiah 28, 11, 12, 13 is this prediction of the fall of Jerusalem, the, the that God would speak to these people with another tongue. And that's exactly what you see going on in Acts 2 with this fulfillment of The miraculous speaking, and I think it's Isaiah, is it 19, right? Where the Egyptian and the, the other people groups will begin to speak and talk the language of the God of Israel. Is that it? Is it I think it's 19. Well, 19 is where he's, yeah, that's it. In that day, five cities in the land of Egypt will speak the language of Canaan. In other words, the, the name and swear by the name of the Lord of the Lord God of Israel. And she will be called the city of justice. And then it goes on to say, I will send them a man, a deliverer, right? And then it says that I will call Egypt my people. There will be a road from Egypt to, Egypt to Assyria. The Assyrians will come into Egypt. In that day, Israel will be one of the three of my people, Egypt and Assyria. And they will all bless the Lord. And I will say, blessed are my people, Egypt and Assyria and Israel, my inheritance. What? <laughs> How are Egyptians and Assyrians speaking the language of the God of Israel, speaking the language of Cana? How are they speaking and blessing the name of the Lord? They're evil pagans. Ah, but you see, there's a time coming when these evil nations will be turned to the God of Israel. 
And when you see that is one of the many places, one of the many signs that the Messianic age has come. Pentecost is the beginning of that, and not just Pentecost, right? But by Acts 10, when it starts to be the case that Gentiles are coming in. Oh, whoa. Yeah, so you see, even the apostles themselves are learning and figuring out what's going on, right? They didn't know everything all at once. So, I mean, even Peter, right? He had to have that vision because he was confused. Peter thought, I mean, okay, maybe Gentiles can be circumcised and believe, but like, can we really receive them in the exact same way as everyone else? And Peter has to have that vision to teach him. Yes, right? And so uh, the point then in Corinthians, or what about all these Corinthians texts? Now, I would say, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to go through this whole book. We did a whole talk on this, and I did a talk. I mentioned this in the talk on this. So if you go read the triads, um, he has an exegesis of most of those passages where Paul talks about being caught up to the third heaven. And guess what? It's noetic prayer. It's not gibberish. Paul wasn't caught up into heaven to learn gibberish angel language to come back down to earth so that some Benny Hen guy could extort you for money. No, it's noetic prayer, the direct perception of God, the prayer of the noose. That's how St. Gregor Palamas exegetes that passage, and that makes a lot more sense for that passage, right, than trying to understand this as some kind of uh, gibberish language because Paul says in the very text in Corinthians that if it doesn't benefit the hearer, it's of no use. And so if God does express to, to us or to, to the saint the uncreated light or the experience of God that is beyond conception and linguistic framework, that has nothing to do with gibberish and blabbing and rolling around on the ground and acting like an animal, obviously. So again, I would just say all you need to do is read this and I forget which chapter it is. One of these chapters deals extensively with Paul. So, I mean, and he uses Paul, right, like as his uh, preeminent example of that noetic experience. So these texts that the, the charismatics are misusing to try to apply to their weird, creepy prelust visions is rather interpreted, by, I'm saying, by uh, St. Gregor Palamas as the d direct noetic perception of God, which is the very opposite of the things that the charismatics think it is, right? Or the histrionic Roman Catholic saints think, All right? The... As I said earlier, I'm looking for the text, the specific section where he's uh, exegeting Paul's Corinthians passages that way. But this doesn't have a Bible text list in it. So I don't remember exactly which. Here it is, Corinthians. Maybe page 129 if you have this. Yeah, I think it is. Well, that's the proof text that he uses. But anyway, just look up the Corinthians text that he that he he will exegete all those passages in that in that book. But I gotta go be on somebody's podcast, so I'm gonna have to go. But uh, let's get to these super chats. Hopefully, this was useful. Uh, something a little different today, right? I mean, we want, we wanted to dissect kind of some areas that we haven't gone yet. So I uh, hopefully, hopefully you find that useful. Um, Rusty Shackleford for $20 says, here's some ones and O's in advance. Ones and O's. So some bits, you send me some bits from now on, you need to pay me in Bitcoin, Rusty Shackleford, so the, the true one and O. Uh, I won't be able to catch all this right now. DX cat DX. So you're, you're destroying cats. So Rusty's busy out there killing people's cats, so he's not going to be able to watch this stream. So hopefully later when you know, you've buried your significant number of kitties in the ground, you can come back and watch this stream. Panos Costuros, $5. Thank you for what you do, Jay. What's the status of your book on Roman Catholic epistemology? Uh, it's not just on Roman Catholic epistemology. Uh, we're going to do a presuppositional apologetic book. So that'll be dealing with atheism and all kinds of stuff um, i'm way behind i'm sorry i just I don't, I don't i don't know i don't have any update 
Um, I think what I'm going to do is not, so I still want to do that in the other book, but I think what I'm going to do in the meantime, because I had so many essays already written, like several hundred essays written over the last 10 years, I think I'm going to publish, I'm going to redo and publish a lot of the old essays because uh, a lot of those still hold up. And they're kind of forgotten and, you know, things on the internet can just be deleted at any time. They go away. Uh, so, you know, a lot of those old essays, uh, I'm probably just going to put them in a, in a book and self-publish it. It's going to be called, it'll be about 300 pages of, you know, the, the classic essays. Uh, it'll be called Meta Narratives, um, Essays on Philosophy, Geopolitics, and Culture. Uh, that's the that's the title I came up with yesterday. So I'm gonna uh, publish that <clears throat> that probably through iUniverse or something like that. Um, which doesn't which doesn't mean I'm not gonna do the other books. It's just that like I spent ten years of just writing so much material that it's very difficult for me to motivate myself to write again. So uh, which is, doesn't mean I'm not going to. It just means that like I've already written tons of books, <laughs> like tons and hundreds of articles. So, uh, I think I'm going to publish those in the next month or two, uh, just as kind of a, you know, collected essays, anthology type of book. So it, it'll have a bunch of different philosophical topics that I've covered, um, some geopolitics and I'll throw in a few, you know, movie reviews and satire stuff too. So that's actually going to be my next book. It's called meta narratives. Um, I don't know when that'll be out. I, d I just put together the first chunk, which is about 150 pages of text. So that'll be part one within the book. So it'll probably be about 300, 350 pages. Um, so part one is philosophy. And then part two will be uh, geopolitics and metapolitics. And then part three will probably be like more cultural cultural essays and and more movie reviews that are still unpublished so i've got tons of those kind of like prince remember you know prince wrote like hundreds of songs and he could just never had to write any more songs he could just put an album together of all the countless songs he'd written so i'm trying to be like prince to where i don't have to write anymore like i wrote for 10 years and there's hundreds of essays so i can just <laughs> i can just keep publishing the essays i mean but I mean, at a certain point, like it makes sense, right? I mean, why wouldn't I? I mean, everybody else does that. They publish their essays, so why not? And plus, I think there's some good content there. And, and a lot of those essays are still, like I had some, I'm not tooting my horn. I'm just saying, I think I had some good ideas, some good analyses. So, uh, Doorman365, thank you for covering this topic. I thought your mad, fr mad fraud impression was really funny, by the way. Thank you. Oh, yeah, go to that mead feed. Got, I got a, got a whole, uh, all right. oh yeah, we got that made Fred points with the corners here. We got points full of cake icing. Hope you like your cake icing. Casey Neville, $5. Brenton Lingle from Modern Day Debate recently called you out about debating the transcendental argument. He claims Jesus is, is a bodhisattva. Oh. So if somebody like that low IQ thinks Jesus is a Buddha, like, good like that's just that's like clown level stuff uh bunk 25 dollars. thank you for the stream today big ups we up to you bunk thank you jmel 20 bucks where can we find commentary by kirill or the orthodox church about the havana declaration or francis's tutti frutti or catholicism's role in the great reset uh i've covered that a lot uh, i've mentioned the fact that i think the havana declaration is terrible um uh, Snack and I did multiple streams on Tutti Frutti, and uh, I've done two or three talks on the Great Reset and one on Catholicism and the Great Reset. So go look through my catalog of videos in the last six months. But thank you for that, JML. Kevin Brandon, $5. Have you heard of Sri Dharma? I have not. Uh, Pavartaka Akarya? I have not. He's a well known Dharma teacher. I don't know anything about Dharma or any of that stuff. Uh, I think you would have a good debate. Well, most of those people don't debate because they don't, I mean, debate requires Western logic. So um, I'm going to be late for this dude's podcast. Uh, 
would you contact him? I don't, I mean, I don't think so. I'm not trying to be rude or run from the debate. It's just that those people never debate. Uh, but if he wants to come debate, he can. We have a whole discord full of people where we open it up to debates every week. So anybody who wants to debate, they can easily come do that. Uh, but no, not every, I don't, you don't have a right to be platformed by me. I'm not giving everyone a platform. So every dude with 500 subscribers is not entitled to a debate. Uh, thoughts on, I wasn't talking about that dude. Shining Diamond, what thoughts on your old, thoughts on your old opponent, RC Apologist, now conceding that he can't use church fathers anymore. Well, no, I'm glad to see that, but I haven't kept up with or thought about that guy in two years. But, uh, you know, that's kind of what happened to Paul Washer, right? I mean, these guys that are honest with themselves, uh, you know, they come to that conclusion. Alex, $2. In what sense can the Orthodox understand penal substitutionary language with regard to the atonement? Uh, we've covered this ad nauseum. Go watch uh, uh, Cobain's video on the Orthodox view of, uh, just type in Cobain the Christian, the Orthodox view of penal substitution. Um, Shining Diamond, one dollar. Why does the Roman Catholic Church dogmatize useful things like filioque, sacred heart, and immaculate conception, but can't keep a liturgical format for more than three hundred years? Because it is a, a church built around innovations. Uh, Ron Neff, five dollars. Is there some type of article compilation that shows that pagan Stoics, Manichaeans interpret the Bible similar to the Calvinists? Or, um, not that I'm aware of. Um, uh, good question, but no, I'm not aware of that. Uh, Gen Z philosophy, $5. I had a professor today say that the name of God given to Moses in Exodus 3 doesn't mean I am that I am. And that the translators of the Septuagint, the 70, uh, gave it the translation to be more platonic. Uh, I've never, I've never heard this. I don't know. I mean, professors love to come up with these kinds of unique interpretations and theories. Uh, I, have, I have no idea where he says, it. I've never heard anybody say that Aya Asher Aya, uh, doesn't mean I am that I am. Um, so, uh, that's a new one to me. I wish I could give you more. I think if you just go look at the Jewish Encyclopedia, I think they're going to say something like that. Rolfing, Rolfling Stakes, $5. Glory to God. The Uniates get away with not having to agree with the councils of how the Roman Catholic Church structured itself. Sui Juris Church. Each right has its own theology. I know they have their own rights, but it doesn't matter what your right is. You still have to accept Trent. The Council of Trent is not a right it's not a council for the roman right it's a universal ecumenical council vatican one is not a council for the roman right it's a universal council hence it declares orthodox excommunicate and anathema for not accepting vatican one i'm not mad at you i'm just saying macro five marco five dollars i look for italian speaking orthodox churches and they're hard to find there are uh there's orthodox churches in rome uh, i don't know what language they speak They formed an Italian Orthodox Church, part of the Patriarch of Nations, and it is acknowledged by the Tewahedo Church. No, we don't. So that's not us. Okay, that's uh, Coptic. So we're not Coptic, but uh, there's Romanians and there's Russians. There are Russian Orthodox churches in Rome. I mean, in Italy. So go there. Uh, no, you don't have to learn Russian. You can bring your... I mean, I go, if I go to a road course service, I have my English book there it's just like if you went to a latin mass you would have your missile in english ruffling stakes five dollars what does tradition say about people who look for christ but are put into circumstances that don't allow them to go to an orthodox church well, you do the best you can like maybe they are born in the deep south backwoods and they don't live long enough to find orthodoxy we commend them to god and we don't judge them so thank you guys hopefully this was good um i'm running late for this guy's podcast and 